Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to see people online. So uh, welcome to our symposium on differentiable Julia. Uh, my name is Chris Hill. I'm going to moderate the first hour. And our first speaker this morning is Ludovic Ross, who's going to talk about GPU accelerated optimization uh, using Julia AD capabilities for scalable inverse modeling. OK, Ludo, off you go. Yep. OK, well, thank you for the introduction, Chris, and well, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks also for inviting me to, to talk a bit about um, work on uh, GPU accelerated optimization. And well, in particular, uh, about recent work uh, I was doing with uh, my collaborator, Ivan Mitkin, here at ETH. Uh, and we got really excited about um, using basically Julia's AD capabilities uh, for like performing or trying to perform scalable inverse modeling. And I don't have much time, but I'll try to do my best to uh, share some of the um, recent excitement we, with you uh, since we got things working like a couple of minutes ago. Uh, so yeah. uh, maybe a very short intro about Earth System. So well, uh, what is Earth System modeling? So basically, we have system Earth and it's composed of different um, let's say subsystems such as atmosphere, um, ice, the land part, oceans, and what well, certainly many more. Uh, I don't want to uh, kind of be short on that side, but let's keep that uh, global picture. And while well, these little system, they, or these subsystem basically, they interact together. And uh, well, that's kind of an interest. It's particular interest those days because while well, we're obviously uh, everyone certainly feels it now in summer. Like the climate is warming, it's warming uh, in a more than uh, expected way, uh, some extremes here and there, et cetera. So basically the system gets perturbed and well, suddenly it gets then, gets then interesting to, to be, and important to be able to, to predict and understand how this subsystem like interact and, and work together. Um, and well, we are, uh, in glaciology, like doing research in a glaciology group. So we have spe spe particular interest, at least for now, on well, the evolution of ice sheets and glaciers and how these ice sheets and glaciers behave in that uh, ice subsystem and how they kind of integrate as a whole in the Earth system. And so one of the obvious um, observations as on ice sheet and glacier, uh, with kind of regarding a climate deregulation that we're um, experiencing right now, is that basically glacier flow accelerates, glacier and ice sheet melt faster than expected. And here, like the color maps you see, are glacier velocities. And so, well, basically, one of the interesting the, the one of the uh, interesting topics is to understand how uh, ice masses are lost and which rate because this has potential uh, impact for. Well, sea level rise, hydropower, sedentary transport, and, and much more. But ultimately, well, I guess the most important thing um, is, and the big picture is like threat and risk for well, human and human being. So, well, the idea is that well, we do all this in a well, modeling framework. So, well, we cannot and don't want to wait on uh, observation to happen. Well, we want to predict it before it happens, basically. So. For that, then we have like the models, and while models, we uh, want to make like prediction. Here is an example of uh, how, for example, a volume on Alpine glacier would evolve um, under assumption of different or various climate scenarios, and we see that's quite a, a, quite a big vari variability. But that's also where we need the, the modeling exercise for. And while ideally we want to. Um, be able to constrain our model with past observation in order to make more accurate uh, future predictions. So for that exercise, we want to use inverse modeling and ideally scalable inverse modeling. So on one hand, we have measurements devices like for ice flow velocities, for example, satellites. And on the other hand, in our computer, we have a physical description of like how um, we can model the evolution or the, like the ice velocity, ice flow velocity. Then the field, we have field measurements, like we can go and measure uh, ice thicknesses, we can go and measure um, using a GPS, like um, um, ice speed. And in a computer simulation, well, we have to resolve our equation and we want to have like a solution for the ice, ice flow um, well, patterns, well, velocities, uh, etc. 
And and now what we can do in our in, in inverse strategies is we can um, try to define like uh, well we kind of can constrain our computer simulation with measurements. So in that case we have like observed ice thicknesses for example or ice velocities and find our computer simulation using uh, the observation and using like the, 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 the way we do it is like we can define a question that somehow measures how far the uh, results produced with our uh, model are uh, um, away or what's the discrepancy with respect to the observation and then we can basically improve or refine or modify some of the parameters of our model in order to better fit the observation. It's really valuable because well that's a way to somehow um, optimize or tune our models and we can tune on data and then well make uh, ideally better predictions. Well guess what this operation may become a costly cycle especially if one has a heavy forward model so multi-physics 3d and so on many components non-linear and and in our well inversion or um like optimization strategy we, we're gonna have to call well repeat this um costly cycle quite a lot of time so we better uh like make sure that we we use something optimized there and optimize nowadays in terms of computing well guess what i'm going to talk about gpu computing so well a couple of weeks ago like the first exascale machine frontiers uh, powered by amd gpus was just uh, came uh, just announced at uh, oak ridge um well other machines for example in switzerland we have nvidia powered machine but basically uh, most of the recent and top 10 and more supercomputers they run on GPUs because well gpu go fast go fast why GPU go fast? It's because we're, we're limited by the well, memory transfers and GPU actually, uh, GPUs manage to uh, do a much better job in transferring memory, like numbers from memory to compute you need to make the computations. And this can at least 10x uh, higher um, throughput. So yeah, well now, okay, makes sense to run on GPUs, but then why Julia and GPUs? Well, Julia high level language solves the two language problem that we have a, a unique language or single language for prototyping and development and really managed to get us to the uh, hardware peak performance. So for example, using um, some uh, Julia packages we developed, we can really solve like your nonlinear diffusion equation at about like just 7% of peak memory throughput, but actually solving what well, nonlinear diffusion equation, for example. And well, we can scale this up. So go from one to well, here we test the up to 2,197 GPUs, and only losing like kind of 1.5 percent of parallel efficiency. So basically, we are not at all penalized from running on 2,000 GPUs with respect of running on one. Yeah. So now getting a bit more into well, what's uh, our inversion strategy and for this we use the adjoint method the adjoint method is very powerful because while well, we er, well we combine the adjoint method with the gradient descent here and so per kind of inversion step we need uh, one nonlinear uh, forward problem solved one linear adjoint problem solved and then a point wise gradient evaluation and then we can use well um, yeah, the gradient descent in order to optimize the parameter here, uh, for example, an alpha, and uh, given uh, the gradient, so the derivative of the cos function with respect to the parameter we want to optimize. The cool thing is that, well, this approach is independent of the number of dimensions, it's computation uh, may be sensitive to local minima, though, but well, let's skip this for a while. Uh, the way, the cool thing is that. Uh, part of the building blocks we need to make this adjoint method to work, we can get it with optimization, and that's actually the topic of the rest of the talk. Um, yeah, so the cool thing in Julia is there, there are tools for making AD and that works on the GPU. So the GPU stack, CUDA.jl and DGPU.jl, this is already uh, pretty now mature and better. Uh, then there's a cool tool that's called Enzyme and that, per that permits to make um, automatic differentiation on the LLVM le level and this kind of works on GPU and achieves pretty high efficiency. 
And ideally, in the future, we want to combine those and like use it also in the packages we develop, which is uh, for a stencil and inclusive global grid, but that's still work in progress. So a joint method, what we have, we have a forward problem, and then we can integrate this forward problem in pseudo time in order to solve it, so we want the solution of x. Now we can define on a joint problem, A transposed R equal S, and there we can use the same approach so we can uh, integrate um, uh, the steady state equation in pseudo time and try to solve for R. And uh, same, so we kind of a gradient of the cause function, this dj d alpha, uh, which is defined as such. Now the cool thing is that this blo block in red, this actually like, the, those are matrix vector products and these we can get automatically generated by enzyme using automatic differentiation. And well, the, the solution we use here is uh, the so-called pseudo-transient method. Uh, we just got a paper accepted today on the solution method. And the cool thing is that both the forward and the adjoint problem, they basically work with the same uh, iterative parameters. So it makes the thing pretty much uh, robust. Regarding the um, code implementation, so here for solving a 1D uh, nonlinear diffusion equation, making the inversion with AD on the GPU, well, the only thing we need are, well, a residual function here, the residual of the uh, nonlinear diffusion equation, uh, CUDA kernel, and the forward stuff is calling this kernel repeat repeatedly uh, and uh, making some, um, uh, well, damped uh, evaluation and updates for kind of better convergence like this if you're curious is explained in the paper i advertised just before cool thing is for the adjoint we have strategy we just need now to wrap the enzyme uh, autodiff in a in a function such that can be called like in a kernel but that some and we have this duplicated variable and then well the gradient the cost function gradient so just uh, called to enzyme, uh, passing the appropriate uh, temporary variable for the matrix vector product at the right places. So, well, then kind of, I had to unfortunately skip quite some things because we don't have, or I don't have much time to share all my excitement about uh, this, but uh, we managed to get uh, some 2D um, shallow ice um, to work uh, and inversion for, um, uh, mass balance gradient. So that's uh, data from the paper by additionally et al. And they here use a uh, like hand-tuned naive inversion strategy that serves their need. And we kind of try to see if we can retrieve the same uh, using uh, basically AD on the GPU now and without having to do like too much uh, manual derivation or tuning. And so that's what we get. So we here have um, initial um, H, so height of uh, ice, so ice thickness distribution over a uh, synth synthetic topography. And we, our cost function is where well, we try to um, H observation, uh, our like modeled ice thickness with ice thickness observation and well run the inversion to optimize the mass balance gradient parameter. And well, that's what we get. So the sand here shows the evolution of the, uh, well, misfit of the cause function uh, with respect of gradient descent iteration. So while we drop about two orders of magnitude of the um, uh, misfit and over 20 gradient descent iteration. And this gives us a pretty good fit with observation. And so this code was basically an extension in 2D to this short small code snippet in 1D I showed you. And this while well, both the joint residual and the cost uh, function gradient were obtained automatically using enzyme and this run, this run on the A100 NVIDIA GPU uh, like 15 minutes ago. That's why I was a bit uh, late. So, so a lot of we're coming up. Oh. Um, there are many things to say, but maybe regarding performance, as that's kind of why the, the whole motivation, why to do this on GPU. So if we look at the effective memory throughput, so like how efficiently we can uh, use the GPU, we saw that uh, assuming we have a uh, optimal forward problem that runs about one fourth, one fifth of the, the P throughput while solving a real world problem, the joint is totally on par. So well, enzyme is really efficient and managed to Code as, as efficient as our hand coded forward model. 
And while well, this results in very short time per iteration that, well, one could analyze the slope, but it kind of behaves as expected uh, with respect to forward problems. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, while the adjoint solve being linear, it requires much less iteration in our iterative framework because we, um, compared to the forward problem, which is non-linear. So that's also a nice, nice thing to have. And well, not just well, out of nowhere, like comparison between CPU and GPU, well, indeed, we just checked that when our GPU um, framework runs faster, uh, there would be like long discussion and, 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 and different ways to, to, to show this in a very, in a more uh, kind of robust way. But basically, we're like at least toward of magnitude faster on the GPU and it scales much better. So, well, with this, I hope I could share some of our current enjoyment. And I well, want to thank Ivan, who helped out quite a lot on that as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ludovic. So there's at least one question in the pigeonhole thing. So I'm just going to show that. Um, I don't know whether you um, want to comment on that. So it's, can you talk about how easy or difficult it was to use Enzyme to differentiate your code? Yeah, well, um, the, 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 the use of Enzyme itself was, let's say, pretty easy because it's really concise and there's no, well, the big machinery, I guess, is under the hood. So they expose, well, the really nice functions are exposed. Uh, that does everything. Uh, True, like we, we struggle a bit to to kind of uh, guess some of the missing docs. So what I guess documentation enhancement would definitely be very well, very well welcome. But well, we didn't keep that much issue. So uh, th there is one thing that's currently fixed is basically the support for trigonometric function like sine, cosine, power, exponent logarithms uh, on the GPU because there are needed a tweak on GPU compiler to not optimize before the, the AD passes are done that optimize afterwards. Uh, that was just get merged into master. So I guess with that fix, uh, we're pretty ready to go for uh, most of the thing that could happen in, in, in the math world. Fantastic. Okay. So the other question, I think maybe you could type some things into pigeonhole, uh, Ludovic, which is about just how parallel stencil and differential equations might join up one day in some happy union. Okay. Um, so, um, but in the interest of time, I think we have Boris Krauts up next. Boris, I'm going to add your slides to the stream. And you to the video, and I'm gonna Lodo, I'm gonna remove you. Okay. Yeah, so, sure. Thanks, Lodo. Okay, here's Boris, and here are some slides. So Boris is in Mintz, in Germany. He told me, and um, he does solid earth work. So he's been working with Julia for a year or so now, and is interested in uh, both just forward modeling and uh, adjoint modeling. I think so. Boris, do you want to take it away? Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me to this. So as you will see, the equations that we are solving are very similar to those, or actually identical to those in the in for glaciers, but quite different from the Earth and the atmosphere. So the Earth is dynamic, not just on the time scale in the atmosphere of a few minutes, but also on the time scale of millions of years. And that's what we are mostly interested in. And we're doing this kind of simulations where we try to understand what happens if tectonic plates, plates collide and how they form mountain belts. Uh, we try to understand how this is compatible or not compatible with information given in the geological record. And we try to figure out which of the model parameters matter most. So this is something that we do in forward modeling. And a typical example of such a forward simulation is, is shown here, where you see uh, two tectonic plates colliding. We have a, a zone subducting into the Earth. And you see that. Uh, the behavior of this model is quite complex, but this is a case where we model about 60 million years and about one day of computational time on 128 cores. Uh, so this is this is one example of things we are working on. The other example is has to do with how the Earth behaves today and how we can combine that with actual observations. And for example, in the in the European Alps, we have a lot of geophysical data that gives us an information about how the seismic wave speed adapts changes. We also have information measurements at the Earth's surface from GPS measurements or satellite measurements that tell us how it deforms at the Earth's surface. But what we don't understand is how the dynamics of the lithosphere and these tectonic plates are and how we can come up with a 
a physically consistent model that uh, explains all of that. A similar question is here in the Puna system that is in South America, which we believe is the largest partially molten zone in the crust in the Earth, which has uh, tons of volcanoes on top of it. And we try to understand, okay, how much magma is actually sitting there and uh, how does it feed the volcanoes on top? And this is actually an inverse modeling question because you want to link models with actual observations. The same computational frameworks are also valid on comp completely different scales. For example, you can simulate how water flows to porous rocks on a, on a length scale of a few millimeters, or you could simulate how landslides happen at volcanoes here. So what are these equations? These are the equations of uh, the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Uh, as you will notice, perhaps, for the ones of you coming from the atmosphere or oceanography, the conservation of momentum equations look a little bit different. We have no inertial terms and we have no turbulent terms because those don't play a role over the long uh, timescales we are talking about. So mathematically, um, the computational tricky part looks very much like in nearly incompressible Stokes flow equations. And as you can see here, uh, there are no time derivatives in these equations. And much of the complexity comes because we have uh, variations in the viscosity of uh, rocks or the effective viscosity of rocks, which can vary orders of magnitudes between, for example, magma moving through rocks uh, compared to solid rocks sitting next to it. Uh, so much of the ongoing research in our field deals with adding more physics to these equations, for example, to more realistically describe how magma moves through the rocks or how the rocks break. And much of the complexities actually come from the nonlinear rheology of rocks, uh, which is viscoelastoplastic. Since we have no time derivatives in these equations, classically, we have solved this mostly using implicit solvers, using finite element or finite different discretizations. You end up with a big sparse matrix system, which you can solve uh, with a direct solver or iterative multigrid solvers. Uh, more recently, Ludovic and, and others have shown that you can also use this pseudo-transient solvers to solve the same type of equations. And that is nice because it scales much better on uh, GPU, GPUs. So uh, the rheology of rocks is complicated because if you have rocks that are very hot, they creep like a, a viscous fluid, like honey, but with a nonlinear viscosity that depends on the temperature, pressure, composition, etc., on, on very uh, various factors that are actually not so well known for the Earth. Um, on a much smaller time scales, rocks behave elastically. And uh, if you have very high stresses, rocks fail in a plastic manner and, and break. Uh, so the easiest way, the most consistent way with lab experiments is that rocks are nonlinear Maxwell viscoelastoplastic bodies. And, uh, and that can give quite strong nonlinearities. And we're actually working on a Julia package that combines all these point-wise computations into one package called geoparams.gl. Uh, I will probably talk more about the, that in the JuliaCon conference next year. OK, so we have been developing open source uh, software packages to solve the governing equations uh, for this for the last two decades or so. And uh, our 3D scalable parallel package is called LAMAM that solve these equations. And it's basically based on a 3D staggered finite difference mark and cell approach. It is uh, written in C, it uses PET-C, and it scales, uh, it has multigrade condition, preconditioners, and it scales from one to over 450,000 processors. Typically, we use 64 to 128 cores, and we also have a binary build of version available since a few uh, months. So the disadvantage of this code is that because it is written in C, it is a significant effort to develop. It has been a significant efforts with multiple people. And usually, it's actually very difficult for PhD students to get into this very big code and add new physics during the time of their PhD. And this is really one of the big downsides of having this very complicated 3D um, codes. And, and I think Julia can really help to simplify this. So I'll show you a few examples of that uh, later. So let's, back, let's go back to the gradients. Where do we use the gradients? We have basically two applications. One is to solve the nonlinearities itself. Yeah, so typically our system of equations uh, is nonlinear. Uh, so if you want to solve these nonlinearities, you can use Newton iterations. And for that, you need to define a Jacobian, which is basically the derivative of the residual with respect to your solution variables uh, u here. And computing this uh, Jacobian for 
simple problems for linear uh, viscous rheologies or for just power law rheologies is easy and can be done analytically. But if you start to have this coupled viscoelastic visco rheologies, it can become quite hairy to do that. Uh, and moreover, if you add some rheology to that, you would have to redo the whole job again. And this is why automatic differentiation uh, is potentially a very powerful tool to do so. And we started looking about a year ago into whether it's possible to actually do our whole framework uh, from Julia and using automatic differentiation for that. And um, we worked a bit with Jeremy Coston uh, on upgrading the patsy.jl package, um, which is basically the Julia interface to Patsy. Jeremy managed to do a binary builder version of Patsy, which is really cool. So it works in Windows, Mac, and Linux. This is one of the big uh, problems that most of the students I work with have had installing Patsy uh, to start with. So with binary builder, that is much easier now. And uh, Jeremy also created wrappers to the full Patsy package, but we are still working on making uh, most of that uh, more Julia friendly. So if you want to see some of that, you can look at this uh, sub branch. Just to give you um, a proof of concept, uh, this is one code that is in the branch uh, that you see here. And that basically solves the what we call the porosity wave equation. So it's two coupled system of nonlinear equations for the melt content and the magma content and the effective pressure uh, that basically describes how magma may move uh, or rise up in the earth. And the way you end up coding this is that you have to write a, a local residual routine in Julia. And the actual relevant part is uh, shown here. Uh, basically just type down these equations in the final difference scheme and compute a local residual. And if you want to do the same thing in, in 2D or in 3D, you just add a few additional derivatives. So this code is just a residual, full residual code for 1D, 2D, and 3D case. Now the cool thing is that you can use automatic differentiation using the forward diff package to then generate a Jacobian from this nonlinear system. And that is done automatically. Uh, if you can provide a sparsity pattern, that works much faster. And once you have that, you can just call Patsy solve, and it solves the nonlinear system of equations. And you can even run that in parallel. And this is a case where it runs on four processors. And you see you get a nice quadratic uh, convergence of the nonlinear steps. And this is an illustration of how this moves, where you see two waves of magma, where the bigger one starts to overtake the smaller one. Yeah, so this is one example of automatic differentiation that really simplifies your life because if you have a different set of equations here, you only have to update the residual routine and the rest is done nearly automatically. So ongoing work is looking into doing the same and trying to simulate the breaking of rock um, using so-called mode one or mode two plasticity with a visco elastic visco plasticity. So this is shown that this actually works as well in the real world. So let's get back to the other part of the gradients that has to do with the adjoint. And I think Ludovic already gave a nice introduction on how, if we want to fit models to observations, we need to compute a misfit function and we need to change some of the model parameters to better adapt the models to the observations. And you can use some gradient based approach for that to compute this adjoint gradient. So how do you compute that? And it turns out that this can actually be done quite simple because if you have the Jacobian, you only need to transpose of the Jacobian and then you can solve this in a two-step approach. And that basically adds almost no cost to it. So if you, as soon as you have your Jacobian, you can immediately do that and get this gradient of the misfit versus your model parameters P. And this has two very important useful applications. The first one is that you can use this to determine the key model parameters of a simulation. Typically we have model, many model parameters and we don't know which one is the most important one. This is a very simple example that all of you know from physics. This is the sinking of a, of a sphere, Stokes sinking problem. And, and there's an analytical solution for that that is shown here. And what you can see from the analytical solution is that the radius of the sphere is to the power two. So that's the most important parameter. And the viscosity of the sphere itself is not important because the exponent has factor zero. And it turns out that you can reformulate this a little bit to compute the exponents here of each of these parameters in an automatic manner. And then you only need to know the derivative of the velocity versus your model parameter. And that is something that we can get with the adjoint methods here. So we can basically get that automatically for this model. And we can do one computational step and you can immediately get the scaling law out for the sinking velocity of the sphere in case 
you would have known that. Uh, for the simple model, of course, we know that, but for more realistic problems, for example, in this case, we have maybe 50 model parameters, and we don't know which of those is the most important one to, for example, control the uplift velocity at the surface. And we can use this adjoint method uh, to, to basically determine automatically the most important parameters, as you can see. Many of those are close to zero, so they don't matter very much, but some of those have a higher exponent, so those are the ones that actually matter. Now, second application of the adjoint methods is to do gradient-based inversions and actually try to take a 3D geodynamic model and fit it to the observations at the Earth's surface. We have done that for the Yellowstone magmatic system here, where we had a good, uh, relatively good starting model, but the velocities didn't quite fit the observed velocities. And then with a gradient-based inversion, we, we perturbed the most important or the key model parameters, and we managed to get a much better fit. Um, and what this basically does, it changes the viscosity of the lithosphere and the lower lithosphere and the upper course a little bit. Yeah, so this kind of inversions work very well in the case that we have a good, when we have a good starting model, but if we do not have a good starting model, uh, you will not obtain a good solution. So, so that is still part of ongoing research. So just to, to wrap up, the computa computing gradients is really crucial in computational geodynamics, both for computing forward models and for doing inversions and sensitivity analysis. Uh, most of the complexities we have come from adding new physics and rheologies. Yeah? So analytical derivatives can be cumbersome, uh, but automatic differentiation tools can really help PhD students to make, or, or also people like me, to, help, to make much faster scientific uh, progress. And Julia is certainly the way forward. We are working on a range of packages to simplify writing new codes and, uh, and much of that will probably be discussed only next year because it's much work in progress. But if you want to look at these uh, repositories, feel free to have a look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lado. I'm um, not Lado. Sorry, Boris. Thanks. That's great. Uh, and yeah, uh, good to see that uh, you're going to make everybody's PhDs much easier. Yeah. So, um, so do you want to? I'm going to show the pigeonhole screen. There are a few other questions. Maybe we could pick a couple off. Is that okay? Yeah. So um, one, so there's a question here um, about discontinuities and how differentiating the world is even justified. Do you want to see that one? See that? Okay. There are a bunch of discontinuities such as coastlines and non-differentiabilities such as albedo, depending on glacier height. How is I think that's a question for Ludovic, actually. But... Uh... Yeah, I think, but it kind of applies across all the pr the projects. Yeah, we can regularize it, but yeah. yeah. So, so the plasticity that we use is is a discontinuous uh, function as well. So which which you basically would switch on or off depending on um, what what uh, whether the stresses are above the yield stress or not, and uh, and that seems to work. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. So another question that I see is, can Patsy use GPU? Yes, Patsy can use GPU. There has been actually a lot of work in Patsy to make a GPU uh, portable. I haven't actually tried doing that, and I don't think it will nearly achieve the same kind of efficiency as Ludovic has been showing before. So I think if you want to use, for the kind of equations we are solving, uh, if you want to use the GPU, then the first thing I would do is look into the parallel stencil approach. But Patsy itself has made a lot of uh, um, advances in the last decade or so to, to run efficiently on the GPU, and many of the examples actually uh, run. So the other question, do you use the full Jacobian or the action of the Jacobian? In fact, in LAMAM, we use the action of the Jacobian. We do not have the full Jacobian, but we have the matrix-free Jacobian. So that works. Um, yeah. Um, OK. Right. Yeah, so let's, in the interest of time, maybe we'll carry on with the next talk, which is going to be Julian. I think um, Lotto, Boris, and others, you can all go to um, Pigeonhole and add some text answers if you want to, Yeah. Um, so uh, to follow Thanks. the people there. So, okay, thank you. So let's go to see if we can add Julian and get rid of Boris. So now we've got Julian, and Julian is a... We're going to switch to some ocean things, I assume, Julian. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for yes, thanks for ahead. having me. Yeah, thank you. 
thanks for having me here. The most because I, I'm not like um, uh, yet um, uh, Julia language uh, user, so that's uh, that's uh, that's very. Uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here with you discussing those uh, exciting topics. The question of uh, whether or not uh, we may benefit, we may benefit or need uh, differentiable uh, ocean circulation models in the in the, in the future. Um, I'd like to 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 talk about ocean circulation models today. So ocean circulation models are, are one of those uh, numerical tools that we use in combination with observations and inverse methods in general as tools for better understanding and monitoring uh, and forecasting ocean circulation. And obviously, as many other um, fields of uh, um, uh, uh, computational physics, we're um, in this uh, situation where uh, we have this um, this cross fertilization between machine learning, numerical methods, and computational physics. Uh, this emergence of scientific machine learning, and 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 obviously this is posing a number of questions to to to, to traditional fields. So what I'd like to reflect upon in this talk is 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 maybe highlighting a bit some of the aspects where machine learning is 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 now uh, gradually affecting ocean models and 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 why we may need uh, uh, to leverage uh, differential differentiable programming in this uh, context and also obviously uh, listing some of the some of the challenges at the at the at the scientific and community level so first the question of uh, uh, really augmenting um, ocean models with a uh, trainable components so there are many many things you may think of um, doing with machine learning for ocean circulation models and there are maybe three obvious areas where people are really uh, putting quite some efforts right now this includes in particular emulation for accelerating model components the design of new um, of new components um, and in particular for parameterization of missing processes and also the the broad undertaking of uh, 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 improving the representation of uh, uncertainties in those model, in those models maybe with a bit more detail the question of uh, the acceleration of uh, model component is uh, uh, something that is uh, in particular uh, relevant when you have a, a very cost intensive sort of a component in your code that you would like to port to GPUs and some and we have like some uh, some actually working examples not in oceanography yet but working examples in, in particular in atmospheric models where um, uh, uh, heavy lifting sort of uh, components of uh, codes can be can be ported to GPU through uh, through emulation leveraging machine learning um, the, the the second area where there's quite some effort at the moment, and and I guess you're uh, here um, very much aware of this, is uh, is 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 really the question of designing new components with machine learning, and and the most and 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 in oceanography, this is this is this translates into this question of uh, resolving improving the representation of some of the turbulent processes that we that we need to account for, and in particular. Uh, when it comes to ocean circulation, the question of the representation of the the mesoscale uh, eddy dynamics uh, and, and its impact on 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 larger scales, and uh, there are quite some efforts at the moment and large projects focusing on this. And there's a nice uh, review uh, last year issued by uh, Zana and Bolton that really shows um, where the, the sort of status and state of the art in this uh, respect. But beyond um, uh, uh, eddy closures, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge um, uh, realm of applications you could think of, and in particular for the representation of uh, all the processes uh, uh, at fine scale occurring at the interface between the ocean and the and the and the, and the neighboring uh, uh, component in the earth system uh, in the earth system last uh, area where we see like uh, lots of uh, activity at the moment or, or or excitement maybe there's this idea that uh, you could leverage machine learning for 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 really trying to to account better for the propagation of uncertainties in our models and in particular uh, for dealing with them um, uh, more optimally with the information we can extract from ensemble simulations so there's this idea that uh, to some extent we could leverage com in, in combination uh, ensembles and machine learning to try and move towards some sort of uh, an approximate of focal plank equation sort of approach uh, for describing um, the evolution of the of, of ocean circulation um, those are all nice examples but i guess what i wanted to um, illustrate maybe and, and and reflect upon in this talk today is the fact that for many of those applications what we what we need is to augment um, existing codes that may or may not be uh, differentiable with with extra components that can be trained and 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 what you want to do obviously is to train those components so that they achieve optimally some task uh, you want to do that through a minimization of some uh, cost function and 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 the key aspect is to consider that there are two cases um, here obviously simple cases where um, your 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 cost your your training loss doesn't evolve the direct model itself so that's probably pretty easy so that's what people do when they leverage existing database for for uh, for for optimizing closures for instance and there are other cases where you actually really need 
your forward solver to include your forward solver in the evaluation and hence in the minimization process for your for your training loss and this is how um in uh, you you may you may like translate the notion of end-to-end uh, -end training to to uh, to uh, to um to uh, to computational physics with uh, what we may refer to as the solver in the loop sort of uh, um optimization of model component um so far that's that's pretty much of an abstraction and what i'd like to illustrate in the in the in the rest of my talk is um, one specific case where we found that uh solver in the loop actually is uh um a, a, a very useful for for optimizing um subgrid closure so indeed this example deals with uh, um the question of um uh, using machine learning for designing a subgrid closure so all the equations that we're solving they live in a, in a continuous world where all the all the all the scales are are known and obviously because we we have like a finite um, uh, computational resources we can only um, describe a fraction of those scales and because the dynamics is nonlinear we have terms that we need to close and uh, and and this leads to the the, the well-known problem of um, a closure or a subgrid parameterization problems that find many many um, uh, 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 instantiations in 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 all the models in earth system uh, in earth system sciences and we all know that this is this is a highly non-trivial sort of problem because of many uh, good reasons and of, across the uh, over the recent years there's been more and more uh, efforts for trying to tackle this sort of problem with machine learning uh, for both the for the calibration of pre-existing closures for their acceleration or or even like for the design of new components and this is what i will be talking about today um, so the way how this is usually approach is um, you start by picking up a, a source of data and you want this source of data to be to be dense uh, so most of the time it comes from a pre-existing model at very high resolution that you like so you choose your trustworthy high resolution model cloud resolving for the atmosphere some is scale permitting for the ocean then provided you know how to define a projection procedure for comparing um, some information coming from the high-res model with your course resolution solver you can formulate a supervised learning problem where um, you will try and learn this mapping between the coarse grain quantity and the missing flux um, you can formulate that based on your data set you train you learn you obtain a model then you plug it back into your into your ocean model and you pray the reason why you pray is because we need to understand that the problem we've, we've, we've tried to solve here is not exactly the one we really care about. So let me be a bit more uh, precise here. This is related to this um, this notion that is well known in the in the large D simulation community. This difference between what they call the a priori skill of a closure versus uh, what we may call the a posteriori skill of a closure. A priori skill refers to the ability uh, of a closure to actually predict at time t the unknown term in the equations, while the a posteriori skill is what you really care about. So basically, knowing how your closure will impact the solution as it evolves over time. And um, what we what we did in a in a in a, in a study um, uh, submitted to to GEMS earlier this year is really trying to translate this um, difference between a, a priori and a posteriori skill into two different uh, approaches for training, two different strategies for training um, for training uh, uh, an extra component for an ocean model based on um, really uh, this um, this ability of uh, uh, predicting like the missing term versus predicting the um, be, versus being uh, being an adequate extra component component for improving the trajectory of the model over a long time. So that's what we did. And we did that in particular in a, in a very simple flow, uh, quasi-geostrophic turbulence. Uh, you all know those equations, uh, um, uh, I guess. So we have like uh, invariance, energy, and strophy. And because of that, we have a we have a, a, a specific like um, 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 sort of uh, turbulent cascade that allow both forward and strophy cascade and inverse energy cascade. So that's a, that's an interesting um, a flow for closures because it's actually challenging even for uh, even for empirical closure and up to and up to recently uh, uh, really challenging for machine learning based closures. So provided we know how to uh, project information from the high res to the low res, we're able to um, to formulate uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, reduced equations and we will try and learn uh, an extra term that will uh, improve the reduced form of the equations. The way how we want to do that is by uh, training a neural net and this neural net will be the same in two Experiment. One where we'll train the neural net with an a, poster, a, a loss based on an a priori criteria, trying to make sure that the prediction at time t for a missing term is up 
optimal, so without running the model itself. And another one where we actually will try and optimize the parameters of the closure based on an past and on an posterior learning criteria where we will compare the model solution as it evolves over time. The neural net that we're training here is very simple, no, uh, no, uh, no, um, no fancy magic, just a plain, uh, plain, uh, 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 plain CNN uh, without any uh, any uh, any fancy uh, uh, new stuff. Uh, the results, what you see here um, on the top left panel, you see like the sort of target we we, we want to achieve in terms of a dis typical distribution of uh, a spatial distribution of vorticity. On the on the right, you see like the predictions coming from different models. Uh, on the top, empirical models, and at the bottom, trained models coming from uh, from machine learning. And what you see is that the baseline sort of uh, empirical solution is, are usually too diffusive, uh, while the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the the machine learning learning ones can be either unstable or stable, depending on whether we use a priori or a posteriori learning strategy. So basically, in a natural, the idea is that with a posteriori learning, we're trying, we're able to actually improve uh, drastically the ability of, ma of machine learning model to actually um, be a good closure for, for this type of flow. And this without changing anything in the actual structure of the, of the, of the closure. I'll skip this uh, slide. We can come back to this uh, um, if we have any questions, because I'd like to uh, take um, one or two minutes to uh, reflect on what I think are the, the sort of issues and opportunities that, that our community may be facing in the coming years. Um, so the first thing we need to really acknowledge here is that although we've presented like uh, an example, um, it's not clear to me yet whether uh, uh, the benefit of a solver in the loop sort of training approaches would generalize to more realistic flow configurations. So we really need like community effort for benchmarking and intercomparing that sort of approaches. Um, there's a very good uh, example um, presented here in this uh, paper recently submitted by Andrew Ross uh, to James. And most importantly, we need to understand that um, those um, those end-to-end -end training approaches, they will only be able will only be able to leverage them for sh over short windows because of the complexity of the computational graph. So if we really want to train and to optimize closures for climate relevant sort of metrics that require long time integration of our models, we will need like a work around and other strategies. So um, um, uh, to solving the loop approaches will not be the end of the will not be the end uh, the end of the of the game here. Um, one point I'd like to illustrate also is the fact that. Um, there's an interesting connection between this approach, like using the solver in the loop for training a closure. It's actually very similar to, uh, to deploying a, a strong constraint 4 var algorithm for optimizing the neural net parameters. So we have like interesting uh, um, uh, uh, connections here that in the end probably means that we could think of uh, leveraging directly observational data for optimizing the model, the model, not only the parameters, but the formulation of the model itself. So this is something that I think we need to reflect upon in the future. Obvi obviously, the most important problem here is how we switch to differentiable models. So many groups, including in this audience, have started like rewriting entirely uh, their code uh, so that they could leverage uh, uh, AD and 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 the, and the full power of uh, differentiable uh, programming. Uh, for others, uh, we may think of uh, maybe using uh, emulation, and that's something that we may discuss uh, later. Wrap up. I'm done. Thank you. Very nice. Thanks, Julian. That's fantastic. So um, are you okay to go and look briefly at the uh, questions, see if there are any new ones that are good to talk about? Um, I think everyone was busy listening. So there's one, though. Is there a role for emulators in creating more efficient ensembles? So I guess that's a kind of sort of so are, dynamics -y question, yeah? Yeah, there are. There are I, I think we're really at the at the beginning of this um, uh, of this um, idea of using machine learning in combination with direct models for accelerating our ability to describe the evolution of PDFs. And indeed, one of the one of the things you may think of is using um, emulators for acceler acceler accelerating the computation of individual trajectories. Or you may also think of uh, using uh, emulators for uh, optimizing the, uh, the the sampling of the distribution based on uh, some some representation of, of the distributions. There are some examples in uh, in very idealized um, problems, but not yet, to my knowledge, to uh, applications to uh, multi-dimensional uh, systems like the one we're facing in oceanography. Thanks, great. And I see in the YouTube chat, somebody's mentioned surrogates.jl is a thing we should all look at, I guess. 
That's the great Thanks. thing about Julia Connor. You always find these new things in every every talk. So, okay. So now I think we're on to Laura. Nora. Why am I getting everybody's names wrong? Sorry, Nora. So let me try and add. Let me get rid of Julian. Bye, Julian. Let's add Nora. Hi, Nora. And Hi. Add your slides. So, Nora, so we're going to go from Grenoble over to the um, the Rockies, yeah. So from the Alps to the Rockies. And uh, Nora again is you're on the ocean side. You're going to talk about uh, uncertainty quantification and ocean observing systems. Yeah. Take it away. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So my name is Noah Lose. I'm a postdoc at. University of Colorado Boulder, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can use differentiable Earth system models um, and their adjoints for uncertainty quantification and observing system design. Yeah, and as Chris said, uh, for this talk, we'll stay in the ocean. And and as Julia, I'm I'm not for this for this talk. I'm I haven't used or I'm not using Julia um, yet, but a Fortran model with its adjoint. But the idea is to use similar ideas uh, for for differentiable Julia models. Okay, so here's a little bit of background on ocean state estimation, or it's it's kind of similar to 4D VAR data simulation. And this is the framework I'm working within today. So the idea is to, to um, combine ocean observations and ocean models in an optimal way. So here on the left, we're, we're looking at an example of, um, of an ocean observing system in the North Atlantic. It's called the OSNAP array. And the OSNAP array... Um, is monitoring temperature, salinity, and velocity um, yeah, with these moorings, so-called moorings. And this happens along this section from Labrador to the southern tip of Greenland all the way to um, Scotland here. So in terms of ocean observations, these instruments are extremely densely spaced, but you still see there are gaps, right? And these gaps are certainly larger elsewhere in the ocean. So how do we infer ocean properties and ocean circulation in these gaps away from the instruments. And this is where um, ocean state estimation comes into play. So an ocean general circulation model knows about the equations of motion and physical conservation laws. So we're filling these gaps in a way that the resulting ocean state and circulation is um, consistent with both the existing ocean observations and the physics encoded in our model. And practically, this is done um, by solving an optimization problem where you define yourself a cost function J um, yeah, on the, on the space of uncertain model inputs. And this cost function has two parts. Model data misfit is the first part, and the second part is the regularization. So um, yeah, the optimization problem now consists in finding the minimum of this cost function, because the, the minimum provides the best combination of model parameters that is most consistent with both the observations and the model. So how do we find this minimum? Well, we can do gradient-based optimization if we have, you know, if we have the adjoint available, um, or if we have gradients, and this is exactly what the model, model adjoint provides us with. So um, let's go a step further. Let's let's assume we've found this minimum, right? So this best best guess um, of ocean of the ocean state and circulation. How do we quantify uncertainties in this solution? And it turns out that you can um, interpret the deterministic ocean state estimation problem that I showed you on the previous slide in a Bayesian context. And then Bayesian inference um, tells us that the posterior probability um, distribution is given by e to the minus j, where j is the cost function. But it is essentially impossible to, to sample from this or to, to compute this, this um, posterior probability distribution by sampling methods, just because the control space or the, the model where, where this where this U live, lives is, is way too high dimensional. It's typically 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 in ocean state estimation. So we have to make some sort of approximation. And if you make an, a Gaussian approximation, you get um, yeah, a Gaussian with mean equal to the minimum of your cost function and, um, and posterior covariance matrix equal to the inverse of the Hessian of the cost function. So, and this makes sense, right? Because the Hessian kind of consists of the second derivative. So in other words, the curvature. So the more curved your um, cost function is around the minimum, the better constrained is your solution, the smaller are the posterior uncertainties. So we want to get at this Hessian. Um, and again, it's computational prohibitive to compute a full Hessian, but what we can do is to compute a low rank approximation where we um, yeah, compute the leading eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's apply this 
um, to a real world example and go back to our OSNAP array in, in the North Atlantic. Um, so to put all these instruments in the water and maintain them over the year is a huge and costly effort. So this is the OSNAP array project. It's a, it's a large international project, but if you only count the funding that comes from the US side, it costs about 30 million US dollars to keep this observing system up and running for only five years. So the takeaway is ocean observing systems are pretty expensive to build and maintain. So it is critically to ask, um, how can we build efficient or even optimal observing systems? Um, how can we minimize redundancy between these instruments? Um, is this a, a good configuration or could we maybe skip some of these moorings and, and place them elsewhere? And one way to answer these questions um, is to use Hessian UQ because you can say an observing system is optimal if it minimizes the uncertainty either in the model parameters or in some important ocean metrics that you define. So I'll show you some results or some work I did on this. And yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm using the MIT GCM, which is a, an ocean general circulation model coded in Fortran and it has an adjoint. So let's focus on first on, on one single observation up here. Um, um, this is yeah a temperature observation at an OSNAP mooring in the Erminger Sea, close to the southern uh, southern tip of Greenland here. So this map um, predicts that observing temperature at this yellow location will predict uncertainty uh, will reduce uncertainty in wind in all locations that are shown in red and blue here. And wind is part, or wind at every uh, surface model grid cell is 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 a subset of um, the uncertain model parameters that we're trying to constrain. So, in other words, the this this temperature observation here at this yellow dot does not only contain uh, information about the local temperature, but also about other model parameters, and far away from the measurement location. And this is um, yeah, this is quantified via derivative-enabled Hessian UQ within the MIT GCM or the Echo State Estimation Framework. Um, and what we're actually looking at here is um, actually the, the first eigenvector of the Hessian that is associated with this temperature observation. And if you only have one observation, then the, um, the, own, the first and only eigenvector actually is, um, is given by, essentially given by the, the gradient of the temperature at this location to all um, yeah, to all uncertain model parameters. And there's only one derivative appearing here because in this case, I used the, the linearized Hessian or the Gauss-Newton Hessian. This is something that's um, often done. Another point to note is that to predict, to compute the uncertainty re reduction like here, you actually don't need to know the, me the actual measurement value at, at this location. So you don't need to know if the temperature, if if the measurement will give you three, five, seven degrees. Um, the only thing you need to know is the, the measurement location, frequency, and uncertainty. So this is this is this is, I mean, this is a valuable property because you can actually, you know, predict the uncertainty reduction before putting the instrument in the water. And then I want to make one more point about this figure, um, which is that the spatial pattern of uncertainty reduction that we see here can be explained by ocean boundary wave propagation. So there are essentially two mechanisms at play here in box one and box two. I don't have time to go into the mechanisms today, but the takeaway is that, um, you know, Hessian UQ is not just a black box that tells us, oh, uncertainty will be reduced here and there. It also gives us dynamical insight looking at these Hessian eigenvectors you know, we can infer, we can say something about the dynamics and physics that, um, you know, that reduce the uncertainty. So let's now go a step further and look at not one, but three temperature observations. So the first one is still the, our, our usual one here in the Omega C. The second one is one off the Portuguese coast. And the third one is between Greenland and, and Iceland here in Denmark Strait. And these three maps, again, show the uncertainty reduction that is implied by each of these three observations. So we've talked about this map. Let's look at this one, the second one. Um, it, it looks like the Portuguese coast observation is only sensitive to this mechanism in box one, but not in box two, right? 
while the Denmark's trade observation, it has a pretty similar pattern of uncertainty reduction as the Irminger C observation. So now the question is, what happens if we add either the Portuguese coast or the Denmark's trade observation to an existing Irminger C observation? How much information do we, how much extra information do we gain um, by the second observation? And yeah, we can we can look at the hash and UQ analysis. So what hash and UQ or yeah, what it does for us is it gives us orthonormal eigenvectors, right? So this orthonormalization basically takes care of um, removing redundant information. So if we do this, we this this orthonormalization, we and look at the Denmark trait, um, we see that a lot of the sensitivity information up here got removed, right? So and so this tells us that the Irminger C and the Denmark Strait observation, they um, contain a lot of redundant information. While the Portuguese coast observation, it looks, the, the sensitivity pattern or the uncertainty reduction pattern, it, it looks pretty similar, um, like before and after orthonormalization. So that tells us these two um, contain a lot of complementary information. So in this example here, observing at the Portuguese coast gives um, gives more independent information than observing at Denmark Strait. Um, so yeah, the takeaway from the slide is that you know Hessian EQ allows us um, to assess um, data redundancy versus complementarity, and since all of this can be done um, before putting the instruments in the water, you know it's useful. It's a useful tool for observing system design. Sorry, so two, min two minutes, Nora, or one? Yeah, I think I need only uh, half. Okay. So. Yeah, let me quickly wrap up. So I've shown you that, you know, we can use differentiable models and derivative enabled hash and UQ to do a couple of things. So first of all, we can deal with high dimensional spaces of uncertainty of uncertain model parameters, something that sampling methods, MCMC methods alone cannot deal with. And then we can, along the way, we get dynamic insights on causes of uncertainty reduction. And yeah, we can we can use this also for observing system design problems. And then as an outlook, I would be yeah, really interested in in trying some of these things um, in with yeah differentiable Julia models, and but also maybe try some more hybrid approaches where we, you know, we can we can do stuff like graded enabled MCMC that also work for more nonlinear problems where you cannot just um, um, yeah sample or compute Gaussian approximations but more yeah more more complex uh, posterior distributions okay thanks Fantastic. thanks nora that was that was awesome um so let's go just see if there are any more questions so um so there's a question about how computationally expensive is eigenvector computation compared to a single prognostic model computation yeah, so I guess this, so in general, I mean, you basic, so I, I mentioned, I actually only use the um, delinearized Hessian. So you essentially you only need um, first derivatives. So your question in this, in this case, it boils down to how expensive is an adjoint solve versus a forward model solve. And um, I mean, theoretically, I mean, it, it, it is also connected to the fact, um, so to something like called checkpointing, because we are like, check so if you like if you compute the adjoint right you you basically you compute the um the derivative starting like from you going like backward so you have to um since we're since it's a time dependent problem you have to kind of you always have to need uh, you, you always have to know the the forward model state at every time step so this kind of makes it um a little bit more expensive so in, in you basically have to depending on your on your checkpointing but it, it will be maybe three times more expensive than a for, forward model run or or more but i think there are actually there are some other people here in the audience who really work on checkpointing so they can yeah they we'll, can... we'll have some we'll have some talks specifically about some of the technology yeah. a bit later. so uh and then there's one more which is how do you orthonormalize the field did you use a julia package i think you know not yet, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> No, so this was all using um, the MIT GCM, which is uh, which is a Fortran model. But um, yeah, that would be would be a good thing, cool thing to try in the future. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good lead into um, the session that Krishna is going to lead in a minute, which is kind of starting to look at 
tools and things like that. So maybe thank you, um, Ludovic, Boris, Julian, Nora. Um, I think we're going to start into the next session. Um, anybody should feel free to go onto Pigeonhole and answer questions and things. Um, but uh, I think that was those were great talks. So thanks, everybody. Um, and I'm going to remove myself and hand over to Krishna now, yeah? Chris, could I ask you to stay on and uh, start your talk right away, if that's okay? Okay, I thought Mathieu was going first, but... Uh, uh, Mathieu just needs a few more minutes. So. Okay, let me just uh, uh, find my talk. <laughs> I just have to do something where I... I think I stop sharing, and then I share. I just have to change a tab, and then share again. It's the wonders of the sharing tool we're using. Okay, so here we go. Share, and... And then I go and add to stream. Right. Uh, okay. Let me say a word about you, Chris, <laughs> despite you chairing the previous session. Uh, <laughs> Chris is a computational scientist at MIT, and he has developed ocean and planetary models and modeling tools that are used by many, many people. And he is going to now talk about his latest creation, Oceanigans, in DJ for. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Krishna. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's not really my latest, it's a team effort. So, um, but I'm going to talk about Oceanigans, which is a Julia-based ocean model that um, a bunch of folks at MIT have been and elsewhere have been collaborating on developing. It is in the context of DJ for Earth, I'm going to talk about how we're starting to look at how to do derivative um, calculations around this, this framework. So um, it's our first foray into kind of applying derivatives to Julia code. So Oceanigans is a um, ocean modeling a uh, tool developed entirely in Julia and is designed for non-hydrostatic, hydrostatic and shallow water type problems. So these are mostly rotating stratified finite volume fluid problems. It's all open source software. You can go to GitHub and take a look. It's being developed under a larger project known as Klima. And it, it, a lot of it is based on algorithms from the MIT general circulation model, which is the model that uh, Nora just showed some examples from. Um, it is a, you know, GitHub Julia package. And so there is, you can go to uh, your Julia REPL and uh, add the package and then start using it. There is under the GitHub site, a nice set of examples and kind of getting started material that kind of orients you a bit. I'm kind of going to talk, I'll show a couple of pictures, but then I'm going to talk more about how we're thinking about um, introducing some enzyme-based differentiation into this and other and, uh, dif uh, differentiation work, primarily in the context of DJ for Earth. So just before that, though, <coughs> here's a couple of snapshots from current um, Ocean Anigans setup. So uh, this is a um, kind of proof of concept pilot run of a global ocean circulation problem that um, Simone Silvestri is running on uh, GPUs with Ocean Anigans at the moment. Um, and so this is kind of a, a recent uh, result. This just shows sea surface height for anyone who's oceanographically oriented. You know, we have some eddying Gulf Stream. We have an ACC. We have um, equatorial waves. So the sorts of um, fluid dynamics you expect in the large scale ocean and that you'd see from space if you look at things from space or if you go out in the field and measure them. Um, so it's kind of a got a lot of the there's still some work to do to make it kind of up to speed with um, state-of-the-art ocean models, but it has many of the dynamics that you would expect to see in an ocean model. Um, at the other end of the sort of scale spectrum, this is looking at a um, simple 2D um, Rayleigh Bernard convection problem where I think we're either heating from below or cooling from above, not sure which. Um, it looks like we're heating from below, I think. And um, just looking at um, convective overturning and non-hydrostatic dynamics. So this is a very small scales. This would be like a a thousandth of a pixel within this large scale uh, model. Um, but the same kind of um, dynamical engine can do both of these. So Oceanigans uh, is being developed as a sort of fairly flexible library for doing uh, problems from you know these planetary scale things down to these process scale things, which are all, as we saw in kind of Julian's talk, um, things that come into setting the overall climate of the ocean um, and control you know how, how ocean dynamics affects the planetary system we all live on. So I'm going to actually delve a little bit into kind of the technical nitty gritty. We're going to, you know, now we've kind of had these overview talks, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of some of the 
detailed work within DJ for Earth. Um, so I'm going to delve into how we're thinking about applying DJ for Earth type and enzyme and things to oceanogans. So the oceanogans. So I'm going to start by just kind of showing a little bit of the anatomy of oceanogans. The full code base contains many parts, um, and we're actually only focusing on some um, subset of those parts for the first stages of the derivative and differentiation work uh, we're looking at. So this on the right, and we're going to look at some simple advection problems, and that's what I'm going to uh, kind of walk through in a minute. Um, but this on the right shows sort of the full um, anatomical structure of oceanogans. So starting at the top, you've got a Julia package, and then there are these kind of high-level abstractions we've, that have been created called simulations and models, um, diagnostics, IO. Checkpoint restart here is actually, I, I just realized that's not uh, checkpoint as in what Krishna, I think, or Michelle is going to talk about later in the kind of um, uh, uh, along the lines that uh, Nora spoke about. This is more um, just a utility for actually when you're just working with prognostic models. But there, there's some obviously some overlap with what you need in uh, reverse mode AD as well. So, um, but the main picture the thing to get out of this is there's a kind of upper level of this of structure, which is around kind of configuring things for studying the ocean and doing kind of, you know, science level experiments. And then green, there's kind of a lower base layer of kind of all the tools you actually need to do that. And we've got things we call abstract operators, fields, grids. Um, and then at the very bottom, what's uh, KA here is short for kernel abstraction. So this is a Julia package that lets everything run either on CPUs or GPUs fairly, fairly well. Um, and the the core of oceanogans in terms of a kind of numerical engine and the things that we want to differentiate are kind of time stepper things, these fields which just re represent discrete spaces of um, the state of your fluid, say temperatures or velocities, and then grids which actually have um, kind of, you know, represent the, 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 the discretization a field sits on top of, and operators which are kind of like um, simple um, finite volume uh, calculus operations that, that you can apply to fields and grids. Um, and just as sort of an aside, in terms of the things I'll show, the white things are kind of things that one sees in a bit of code that is kind of written in by a user of ocean and against the black things are more under the hood. Um, but we, you know, just to give a sense from this is really that, you know, it's quite a large system. And right now where we are with things like enzyme is we're not trying to kind of attack all of it in one go. We're trying to kind of work through some um, subset of this. So the problem we've started looking at in the context of enzyme is really just kind of the most, one of the most basic things you could look at, which is just, let's see what, how, can we um, get enzyme to kind of essentially digest through this kind of stack of things here, but for a specific um, instantiation of the code. So enzyme, you know, sees the LLVM backend. So it kind of knows what the instantiation is and only has to worry about um, things that are sort of active um, or that's what we'd like it to do. Um, so the simple problem is just advecting with a non-divergent discretized analytical solution to the Stom or JAR equations. I think um, Sarah is probably going to show a little bit of modeling work related to this, but these are showing analytical um, uh, solutions. So, uh, the Stommel jar experiment is a classic um, kind of analytical paper that was uh, done in the early 50s that helped everyone understand why there's a Gulf Stream. Um, you can solve it numerically. You can also um, just uh, write out the kind of analytical solutions that the numerical solutions should um, correspond to. So this is showing the analytical solution. So you have uh, in the Stommel jar experiment, you define a stream function. So that's kind of, so we're looking down on a, a box of water in this case i've set it so it's like a thousand kilometers by a thousand kilometers but the size is kind of a free parameter in this um so you can think of this as you know a very crude approximation to um, what goes on in a ocean gyre where you have a western boundary current like the gulf stream or the or it's going this way if it's gulf stream or the curacio um and that you have um flow going uh, towards the east here and towards the west here uh you have flow going north here uh, going Northwards, all the way around, you have a kind of um, circulation in this direction, uh, supported by the north-south flow. So, um, and so this this analytical solution, we can actually then 
put that into something like Oceananigans, and we can think about going back to our um, kind of differentiation hat. Um, what it is, it, what is it we would like to have as be as a dependent variable and independent variable in this code? So, in our case, we're going to just simply first imagine putting a um, a dye into this fluid, it's concentration C that might vary with space and time. Um, so we might put a blob of dye here and look at carried through. We can define a um, dependent variable J, which is simply the flux of dye across a little uh, dotted line here, okay? Um, so we define J as the transport of a trace of C through a surface, the, the dotted line. And then we can ask things like, how is J, or what we'd like to is how, how is J sensitive to the um, independent variables. So in this case, it might be the zonal flow or the flow, yeah, this is the flow vector, um, um, or it might be the trace concentration. And the nice thing about the analytical problem is um, we actually, for the flow fields, we have analytical definitions of these. So we can actually ask, we can both kind of do this numerically, but we can also interrogate the equations to sort of compare with how we're doing against um, analytical solutions. So um, so our kind of independent variables will be things like a tracer concentration, wind stress. So the flow field is a function actually of the wind stress. Um, and so these crop up in the analytical equations so we can kind of um, connect the two. So the sorts of things we're going to, we're exploring, we have not completed doing this yet, but looking at with enzyme is this notion of, you know, in a, adjoint or reverse um, mode computation, we'd like to see that the propagation of sensitivity, so the propagation of this J influence, so if you imagine a die is carried forward through this line here, if you ask what is the sensitivity of this, of the flux across this dotted line to the die distribution earlier on, you expect that sensitivity, that partial derivative to actually propagate backwards in time. And we want to be able to generate that automatically um, by applying enzyme to our codes. We could also do this in this case analytically, but the whole point is to kind of um, let enzyme find this for us so that we can then do the sort. Of, and these are exactly the sorts of um, problems that Nora has been talking, was talking about with the propagation of waves down the Eastern boundary and so on. Um, there's a, advective and a wave uh, part to what Nora is looking at. We're going to look first at the advective term, but there are things you can look at that are also uh, wave-like in the same framework. So, um, you know, some of the things we're starting to look at are, can we fully automate this computing, this numerically, um, all in Julia? First using simple tape forms where, you know, Nora also mentioned saving trajectories so you can reverse, uh, traverse them in reverse mode. Um, in kind of the machine learning world where you do this, where you're thinking of uh, reverse mode as back propagation. Typically, you don't have to think as carefully about how to scale your checkpointing approach sort of in an unlimited way. Um, so you can sometimes get away with a very simple tape kind of way of recording or some optimization, but not um, having to really go fully to town on it. In the sorts of time dependent fluid dynamical problems we really care about, um, you need a highly sophisticated kind of checkpointing approach. And um, Krishna and Michelle are going to talk a bit more about the actual under the hood of this. But what we want to be able to do with these test problems is just really um, show that, evaluate those approaches as we start to implement them in Julie's and Julia and show that they can uh, be effectively, we hope, unlimited in kind of their time span by having a hierarchy of things. And this is based on um, algorithms that have been, you know, evolved over many years that um, uh, the Argon group involved in this project are, are very experienced in. Um, just a tiny bit, uh, if I have time, is just to show sort of a little bit of flavor of how we actually do this in Ocean Anagans. So Ocean Anagans, as I said, had these abstractions that we saw on that um, anatomy chart, a grid, a model, a simulation, and then we want to kind of fit that with an enzyme wrapper. These abstractions are pretty simple. So here's, you know, what a grid looks like for this um, um, stomach problem. Uh, we kind of, you know, just declare a kind of rectilinear box with certain dimensions. Um, we actually don't include the grid parameters in independent variables. But, One minute, Chris. Okay. Then a model currently in Ocean Anagans, we a non hydrostatic model type has more hooks for passive tracer advection. Um, so that's fluid 
doing things when the fluid momentum and pressure dynamics are turned off so we can carry it around. Then we can actually define essentially flow fields and tracer concentrations that are based on these analytical formula from the Stommel equation. So I've kind of shown some of the formula on the right here. Um, in the end, it's Julia code that we implement this in. Um, and ultimately, then where we want to end up is just being able to kind of take those building blocks, the grid, the model, and the initialization and simulation, and effectively end up with a code that kind of says J is some function of these things, which, um, which you know, these are the ocean undergoes building blocks in F. We wrap the, those in um, kind of some outer function and then feed into enzyme uh, the request to kind of compute sensitivities with respect to these arguments. So we're kind of getting close to that. We're not there yet, but that is kind of uh, where we are. And that's that's kind of what I wanted to show today. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I, I don't see questions right now on pigeonhole, but I invite everybody to add more questions there. Uh, but to interpret a question that's in YouTube, uh, Chris, how easy is it for to get started working with Oceanatigans for someone who's not done it before? Um, I think on the whole, it's actually fairly easy. It is all, in fact, if you go, we had a workshop on Friday at JuliaCon, and there's some videos showing Greg kind of doing some setting up simple um, problems live in YouTube. Um, those are based on mostly on stuff that's on the documentation on the website. So you can also kind of do it without having to watch him do it live. But it's um, it shows that it's fairly straightforward. It's, there's a few basic ideas you want to get to terms with and then um then you can you can start playing it's designed so you can play with it um, oh excellent well thank you so much okay i will now add matthew morligan um, thanks great so matthew is a professor at dartmouth college whose research focuses on the physics of glacier ice and the role of ice sheets in the climate system over to you matthew Sure. Um, so thanks, everyone. I'm going to talk about something fairly similar to what Chris talked about, but applied to ice sheets. So uh, again, this is very collaborative. It's not just my work. I want to make sure that um, uh, Valentin, especially, that has been instrumental in this work, um, gets credit for it as well. OK, so data simulation has been used extensively over the past 30 years in glaciology, because as uh, for um, oceanography, there is many parameters or so boundary conditions or initial conditions that we don't necessarily um, have observations of. So we like to use inverse modeling to try to infer what they are. And so there has been a number of papers over the years. Uh, the, the main primary application so far has been to infer basal conditions. We observe the surface of glaciers very well. We can't observe what's happening at the bottom. And under glaciers is where we have basal friction going on. So it's very critical for us, I should modelers, to have a good idea of how much stress we should apply at the bottom, um, at the ice bed interface, because that determines how fast uh, the glaciers are flowing. There's been other applications where we uh, people looked at using the same approach to infer the viscosity of the ice, so especially of floating ice shelves. Um, and then, you know, other applications again, but based on the same principles. So the idea, I mean, I'm sure we all know what inverse problem is, but if we, if we provide the model with um, a basal drag coefficient, we, so we just specify how slippery the bed is, then the model um, F here can take this boundary condition and tell us what the ice velocity should be. So this is a, a glacier that's very... Um, looked at in the community is called Pine Island Glacier. So if I give myself a friction coefficient that's uniform, that's the speed that I get. So that's surface speed. And that's also something we can observe that we have here at the bottom. So you see that if I take a guess, a random guess of what the basal friction should look like, you see that my model looks nowhere near what it should uh, when we look at observations. So we want to use, we want to solve the inverse problem where we have the output of the model, we have observations of the velocity, and we want to get this basal drag coefficient. So to do that, uh, people have basically been using the usual adjoint approach. Well, the manual adjoint where you get the gradient of your cost function that measures the misfit between your observed and model velocity, and then you follow some sort of, of um, descent, uh, gradient descent approach. And it works pretty well. Um, so this is my initial state where we have uh, my initial basal friction here, my initial model velocity. This is my target. 
And if we compute one gradient uh, and follow some, some decent approach, then five, uh, five times, five gradient co computations, and we keep going on and on, you see that we end up with a pretty good match. I may have another one, oh, so maybe not. Uh, we have a pretty good match between the model and observations, and we are able to infer what the basal conditions should look like. And it's very powerful. We can do this at the scale of Antarctica. And so you have here the modeled velocity to the left, the observed velocity to the right. And you see that it's doing a very good job. And it's critical when it comes to future projections because we need to get the flow speed right. That's what determines how much ice gets into the ocean and raises sea level. So we, we absolutely need to have uh, this capability. So as I said, uh, uh, this is mostly done in the community by solving the uh, joint analytically. So we have our forward model, we have the joint model, and we compute the gradient and follow that steepest um, decent uh, approach. But some models are now turning into automatic differentiation to do this because it has all sorts of benefits and we can, we can solve um, coupled PDEs. Uh, it's just easier to do with AD. The model I'm using is called ISSM, the ice sheets um, and sea level system model. And I've, I've looked into different tools to do this, to, do, to use automatic differentiation. The first one that I tried to use was uh, Tapenade, which is a great, really awesome tool, but it works primarily for Fortran. So I wanted to see how it would perform with the C codes. So I, I rewrote um, ISSM in C with a, a, a bit of a simpler, simpler structure, and it, it did okay. But Tapenad has all sorts of, of um, shortcomings. Primarily, you need to patch the code. Like you need to have thousands of, of, of patches. So it didn't seem very practical at the time. Uh, they use another tool that's based on uh, object overloading called CodyPack. And it, it really worked really great. So we compared the performance of ISSM CodyPack in C++ to Streamice, which is another model part of VMIT GCM written in Fortran um, that's using an, another AD tool. And we were getting, so here what you're looking at are basically gradients. Uh, I don't need to go into the details, but you see that the AD applied to the Fortran code, Streamice, gave very similar results to the ISSM um, AD tool. Even though it's a different grid, it's a different model with, uh, with different settings, we were getting a very similar result. So it, it works great. Um, but down the line, we, wanted, we want to do something that's a bit more complicated. What we want to do is run the model over the historical period and constrain our parameters using all observations that we have, not only surface velocity, but also surface heights, also, and, and over time, we have time series. So with that, Julia, with its capability of, of universal differentiation, is, is, a, is a very awesome tool. It, and especially the, the machine learning part where we could potentially use that tool to help us better understand the physics that is not well captured in models. So with what we promised we would do um, in the project DJ4 Earth for the ice part was to use explainable machine learning to help us uh, with iceberg calving, which is pretty complicated with the, 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 the current observations that we have, but also developed surrogate models, uh, developed ice ocean coupled sensitivities by uh, coupling dejuice in Julia to ocean nanigans that's also in Julia. These are all things that are impossible to do right now with the current tools we have. So uh, very exciting stuff, but we're, it's only the beginning as you're gonna see. So the first part was to rewrite ISSM in Julia so that we can use these capabilities. And I developed a new model called, called Dejuice um, that's based on right now a simple 2D depth average stress balance. So it's not a full Stokes three-dimensional model. It's a plan view model that actually happens to be doing a, a very good job for fast flowing ice. And uh, the other goal was also to keep a structure that's as close as possible to ISSM so that we could, we could cross compare model results, it's a lot easier to debug, it's a lot easier to, um, to go through all the steps um, to develop a new model from scratch. So the interface is very, very similar. We have one single vari variable called MD that has all the properties. What is the geometry? What is the mesh? What are the numerical parameters we need to use um, to run the model? And then the core where we solve the partial differential equations, it also has a very similar structure to ISSM. So again, for debugging purposes, it's, it's very, very handy to keep that. So we have a big class called FEM model that has inputs, that has parameters, that has elements, 
and we work with these data structures to create our, our um, stiffness matrix, our load vector, and solve our PDEs. So there are some differences because now everything is in Julia, not only the uh, pre and post processing, but also the core. It simplifies a lot the structure of the code. So we don't need to have input output files. Um, we can just work off of that MD variable. It's not parallelized yet, but it will be at some point. So I, I thought I would give you a quick demo of, of what this looks like right now. I worked on a Jupyter notebook for the first time, which was pretty cool. Uh, so this, this is what it looks like. You just load uh, djuice, you create a model. So MD is our variable that contains all the information we need to run the model. Okay, and Russia, can you make the font a bit larger? It's, it's pretty. Ooh, let me see if I, I can think do that. Like shift plus. Yeah, that's sort of, yeah. awesome. How is that now? OK, so I create an empty structure that has all the parameters that we want. And then I call a function called triangle that is going to create a mesh for us. So if I do this, you see that I have my model MD with mesh, geometry, mass, materials that are themselves objects with their own fields that describe all these parameters. And then we can uh, we can plot anything. Like here, I'm just plotting the mesh. And you see this is what my mesh looks like. In glaciology, typically we use unstructured grids because we want to have very fine resolution in uh, capturing these fine ice streams that are draining ice from the interior of the ice sheet to the outside. So with unstructured grids, it's easy to have a variable resolution of, of the model, uh, which is uh, why we do this. And so here I'm just sending all the parameters. We don't need to go into the details, but um, our initial velocities, our rheology parameters, so stiffness, exponents, uh, basal friction, uh, boundary conditions. And then we just called uh, we just call MD equal, equals solve, MD stress balance. And that's where the magic happens, where we create these data structures. Uh, we solve uh, our partial differential equations that are nonlinear in the case of ICE, because it has a nonlinear rheology. So we need to iterate a few times. And then um, at the end, I just plot my results, my velocity. And this is what the uh, results looks like. So we are looking from above at a square ice shelf, so it's floating ice. We have a constraint here that's no velocity. And here we have water pressure um, that's that's pushing the ice, but the ice is spreading naturally. Um, it's sort of a wedge. So that's why the velocity is increasing. And we get exactly, of course, exactly the same results as what uh, we would have with, with ISSM that's based on a C++ code. So it works for square ice shells, but what we really want to do is have a code that works for complex geometries. So here's another example where I didn't set the model with dejuice. I set it up with ISSM, but um, we prepared a package so that we can easily port models initialized with, with the C++ code ISSM and port them directly into Julia, into dejuice. So that's what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I saved a file called temp12k.mat. So it's a mat file. And I'm reading it. Font, please. Oh, sorry. Good point. So I'm I'm just reading that I'm creating a model based on that mat file that is a MATLAB file. And you see we have a few warnings because uh, right now DJUS does not support all the functionalities. But overall, you see that we can we can plot the the any field we have. So we were able to convert a MATLAB-based, ISSM-based model into DJUS in Julia. So we can go back and forth, which uh, which is super handy. So here I'm just plotting the bed topography, and the nodes are highlighted as, as black dots. So as you see, we have a finer mesh resolution along the shear margins here, over here. So that's a pan island again. It's a big ice stream that's flowing towards the coast this way. Um, and we can solve a stress balance again um, on complex geometries. And this is the velocity that we get that, again, looks just like observation, so um, it's doing the job. The next steps are now to embed this into an enzyme um, routine so that we can invert now, we can get the, the sensitivity of a cost function, which may measure the mismatch between observations and models, but other things. So we wanna, we wanna get the sensitivity of this cost function with respect to the model parameters that we don't control well, so using, using um, enzyme. So uh, if I scroll down a little bit, we hear what what I'm defining is the, my cost function that takes in uh, that takes as input parameter uh, my model MD and a friction. 
So let's just, this. what this function does, it solves the stress balance based on the friction that we provided. And then um, gets, uh, we get, we return the square root of, uh, it's basically a um, um, root mean square error between the, the observed velocity and the model velocity. And so that's, that's what's returned. So we get our initial cost function, and then we run this into enzyme where um, we basically have alpha, our friction parameter, and we want to get the gradient of that cost function with respect to alpha by using the autodiff function. At this point, this is running, but it's very, very, very slow. So the next steps are to improve um, the performance of, of that, that function and then play with it and see, see how it performs. Great. That's all I have. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, looking at um, pigeon hole, uh, the, the, the one question is, should, you be, should it really be dejuice.jl? You keep referring to dejuice. Um, yeah. I like the name. It doesn't have to be that name, but uh, that's what we went with. It's for uh, Julia um, Ice model, and D is for different shipple. Yeah, I like right. the name. Yeah, perfect. OK. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Thank you, Krishna. I will remove you now and add our next speaker. Okay. Uh, Sarah Williamson is a graduate. Ooh, let me add you. There you go. Sarah Williamson is a graduate student at uh, the University of Texas, and she's going to talk about AD for adjoints. Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm going to go over a very brief little tutorial uh, where I'll be showing you how we can actually use Enzyme to calculate the adjoint variables. Um, my model is going to be very simple and I hope it will be easy to understand. So let's see. Okay. So the physical model that I'm going to be using is the Stommel three box ocean model. So as you can see, it just has three boxes. This is a really simple ocean model that demonstrates thermohaline circulation between the three boxes. Um, thermohaline is just a, <clears throat> excuse me, a fancy way of saying that the forcings come from a gradient, a density gradient that's driven by temperature and salinity differences. So every box has a temperature and a salinity. This generates a density, and then the density gradient drives the circulation. Uh, despite being such a simple ocean model, we still have quite a few different equations that go into our forward run. So I have equations for the densities of the three boxes, I have an equation for the transport, and then I have equations for the time derivatives of the temperatures and the salinities of the three boxes. So all in all, this is a total of 10 equations, and this is really like as dumbed down of an ocean model as we can make it. Like there's no wind stress, there's no Coriolis force, this is really just bare bones ocean, and it still is uh, quite a bit in the forward run. And so the sensitivity, like a lot of people have spoken about using the adjoint to calculate the sensitivity. The example that I'm going to be doing is let's pretend that we want to know the sensitivity of the final temperature of box one to the initial temperature of box two. By choosing this example, we've already chosen our cost function, which other people have also talked about. So my cost function is this J of X of T, where X of T is the state of the system at a time T. Uh, my state is a six by one vector. I've got temperature one, temperature two, temperature three, salinity one, salinity two, salinity three. And this is really just this inner product of a unit vector with the final state. So this is genuinely just returning to me the final temperature of box one, since that's the first entry in the state vector. And then theoretically, the sensitivity that I'd like to calculate would be found via this gradient. It would be the derivative of this cost function with respect to the initial state of the system. But I can't really take a derivative of a function that only depends on x of tf. So what we're going to do is we're going to use enzyme to calculate this value. Um, and a bit computationally of what I'll do is we'll run the forward model with the steps, compute densities, compute transport, update temperatures and salinities, and I'll just run this for however many steps. Um, and then we'll run enzyme backwards to calculate the desired gradient. And I'll talk a bit about what I mean by running enzyme backwards. And so how is the sensitivity actually calculated? So given our cost function, we're gonna define something called a Lagrangian. This is really just a fancy way of getting at the gradient that we wanna calculate. Um, and so within this Lagrangian uh, MathCal L, we have two new variables. We have mu of t, which is what people have been referring to as the adjoint variable. Um, so really the adjoint variable is just this Lagrange multiplier. I also now have something called 
capital L. Capital L is a forward step, so capital L will take x of t minus delta t to x of t, um, and that that's all that it's doing. So that's encapsulating like the density transport time derivative update. And our goal will be to find the minimum of this Lagrangian, which is where the gradient is zero, right? Because if we want to find a minimum, what do you do? You take a derivative and you set it equal to zero. Um, and all of this leads to something called the adjoint equation. So we have one, two, and three. And the adjoint equations give us a really nice, easy way to step backwards with these adjoint variables, these Lagrange multipliers. So if I set this to zero and I solve it for mu of tf, I get the first last adjoint value. And this is what I mean by running enzyme backwards, because we're starting at the final time and running backwards to the initial time. And since my cost function is so simple, I can compute this gradient by hand. This will just be that unit vector in the first direction. The adjoint equation with the intermediate steps, so like the times between the initial time and the final time, give me a way to go from mu of t plus one back to mu of t. Um, and then this final adjoint equation really tells us exactly the sensitivity that we want to, we want to know about the model. So this is what we're trying to get at. Um, and then the next log like logical question would be to ask, so where does enzyme come into play in all of this? Enzyme will be calculating for us these two actions. Um, so the action of the Jacobian of our forward step acting on the last adjoint variable. And we can kind of think about like why this would be so complicated to do by hand, even for such a bare bones ocean model. Like this L is computing for me a bunch of different interconnected equations and taking a Jacobian of that by hand would be potentially doable, but rather complicated. And enzyme and AD in general makes this very easy to do, which is really nice. Um, and then we can just very briefly think about like, what does this gradient actually tell us about the model? So this gradient tells us by how much we would expect the final temperature of box one to change if we perturb the initial temperature of box two. So this is that sensitivity. Um, it's really easy to see this explanation with a Taylor expansion. So if I expand with a small perturbation epsilon around my initial state, then you would expect it to be approximately j at this initial state plus the perturbation times this Jacobian, which is exactly the sensitivity that we're going to calculate with enzyme. Um, and here, when I like I mentioned before, j is really only dependent on x of tf. So this is really saying like if I perturb my initial condition and I run it forward to the final state, um, this is what that's saying. And this will also, if I rearrange this and solve for the derivative of j with respect to the initial state, this gives me a really easy way to check that the gradient that enzyme has computed is correct. And this is a good rule of thumb is to check your gradients. Um, so specifically, as I take smaller and smaller perturbations, I would expect that this approximation will converge to the adjoint value that we're looking for. Um, and so now I also have a Jupyter notebook uh, with just like the, just the example enzyme calculations. So first I have here the models of the, or sorry, the equations for the model. Um, so I have an equation for transport. I have equations for the densities of the three boxes. And then I have equations for the time derivatives. Um, and the time derivative step depends on if my transport is positive or less than or equal to zero at the given t. So at any step, I'm only really looking at one set of six. Uh, and so that is what that is. I've already added in the necessary packages, I believe, or I maybe didn't, okay. Um, and so this box is just going to be adding in constants that I see in my equation. So like the volumes, this T2 star, gamma, and so on. So nothing super exciting happening there. We set up functions that'll compute the steps in the forward step, right? So I have a function for density, sorry, a function for transport, a function for density, and I have a function that computes these time derivatives. And then we also, within that, have a sort of Euler step to get the next state of the system. Um, and then I have a function that'll compute for me the states of the system. So this is all I'm gonna do with this is I'm going to run the forward model, however many steps I've given it. Here it's referred to as M. And then I store these uh, in a place that I can look at them later to feed the enzyme. And then I have another forward function. And this is where, this is what I'm actually going to be given to enzyme. It's doing the exact same thing. It doesn't store any states though. So one of the things we might notice is that it's a function of both its input and its output. This is because enzyme takes a derivative of the output, or sorry, a derivative of the input with respect, sorry, the derivative of all the outputs with respect to an input. Uh, it doesn't return anything. This is just what I'm going to be giving to enzyme. Um, and then I have a function that actually does the AD step. And so this auto diff 
is where we call enzyme to act, to, uh, to take a derivative of this forward funk for AD. And so for example, like I've wrapped duplicated around in now and DN now, I'm giving it DN now initially as zeros because what enzyme will do because I wrapped this in duplicate is, is it says, I'm telling enzyme, hey, I want you to take a derivative of the, the outputs with respect to this input and then we'll store that in DN now. Um, and so that just is what enzyme is doing. And then uh, this will just run my forward problem. And so I'm running it for 10,000 steps. I have a DT of 10 days, and then I have some initial condition. This is me running enzyme once. So as you can see, I have 80 old here is that unit vector. This is what I had said in my slides, that that first adjoint variable is the derivative of my cost function. And it just ends up being this unit vector in the first dimension, first direction, say. Um, takes a sec to run it the first time. And then we can just run enzyme back the rest of the way. So this is me just repeatedly running that 80 step function until I get back to the initial condition. And then we're done. So now we've computed the sensitivity. We can look at it. It doesn't mean anything at this point, right? Because it's just a number. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually do that computational approximation using the Taylor derivative. Uh, so what I have here is just a block that will, for increasingly small step sizes, it'll run the forward model to the end. Um, and then I will take the Taylor approximation of the gradient, which is the unperturbed minus the perturbed over epsilon. And then I store that. I'm not storing anything else here. And what will happen is then I can plot the difference of the adjoint variable with that Taylor approximation. And I go one step further and I divide all of this by the adjoint variable just so that we can see a percent difference rather than just a actual difference. It makes it a little bit easier to compare what enzyme found to what the Taylor approximation found. And you can see that as I take smaller and smaller epsilon, we get down to a difference of about 10 to the, a percent difference of about 10 to the minus six. So enzyme has done a very good job computing our sensitivity. Um, I also wanted to mention like some of the differences, like other people have talked about really uh, a lot more sophisticated ways of using the adjoint method. So for example, I stored all of the states in my system. This is something that you cannot do in an actual ocean model and other people have mentioned checkpointing. So this is where you would need to actually implement checkpointing instead of actually storing every single state. But since this is such a simple model, I just, I keep everything. Um, and other people have also mentioned that there are other ways to use the adroit method, right? Like I didn't need to look at the sensitivity to an initial condition. You can also look at a sensitivity to a parameter or you can try to do data assimilation with the adroit method. So there's a lot of different ways that this can be used, but in the, I guess the whole point of mine is that Enzyme makes it really easy for us to actually calculate these sensitivities. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's my whole talk, so. Hey, great talk, Sora. Um, question, um, is your demo on GitHub somewhere to try? Yeah, so there will be a demo on GitHub. It should be up within the next few days for people to play around with. Great, and could you talk about what you plan to do next? What we're going to do next? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to work on, I'm going to help get Oceanan again running with Enzyme, hopefully. So their goal is to add Enzyme to better ocean models, right? Because this three box model is not, it's not really a true ocean model in any sense. It's just kind of a toy model for us to play around with and see that Enzyme works, um, check capabilities. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Chris. Uh, to play uh, Billy Moses's video for um, on enzyme.jl. Okay, so let me try that. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add Billy's video to the stream. Can somebody? I'm going to press play. I haven't checked. So Krishna, can you confirm that the audio works when I do this? I haven't checked this before, so let's see. Okay, ready, go. I'm William Moses, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about Enzyme.js. The work on Enzyme is not just the work of myself, but a much larger group of people. In this talk, I'm just going to be giving a quick overview to Enzyme. There's a wonderful talk coming up on Wednesday by Tim Gimmich going into a lot more detail.
Chris, I think the audio is lost. Could you add yourself to the stream, please? Sorry. I didn't know that happened. Sorry. <laughs> Let me back? rewind and we'll try again. Yeah. Take two. Okay. Billy Moses. Here we go. I'm William Moses. And today I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about enzyme.ja. The work on enzyme is not just the work of myself, but a much larger group of people. In this talk, I'm just going to be giving a quick overview to Enzyme. There's a wonderful talk coming up on Wednesday by Tim Gimmich going into a lot more detail. So to begin, as we saw earlier, derivatives are really, really useful in scientific computation, especially here in the context of earth science modeling. So what's really neat is that it turns out that derivatives, specifically the ones that we want, actually can be generated automatically by fun program transformation tools. So suppose we have here on the left this ReLU3 function that takes in an input and then returns the corresponding output. We can run it through some AD transformation that generates for us a new function, this grad ReLU, that now computes the equivalent of the derivative. There exist three typical styles of doing automatic differentiation. The first of which is create an entirely new domain-specific language where every single operation in that language is explicitly designed to be differentiated. Examples of this in practice include TensorFlow, PyTorch, or Diffie-Tachi. This works really nicely if the DSL that we're aiming to target into matches almost exactly the types of operations that I have in my original program. The second approach is known as operator overloading. In essence, the goal of this is rather than making it an entirely new language, we're going to make specific operations inside of the language be differentiable. As an example here, we have our regular float64 type, now we're going to come up with a new dual of float64 type. And every operation that we previously wanted to define on float64, like add and multiply, we're going to make new versions of this on the dual version of it. Now, not all of the functions that we want to use, especially those that call external libraries or C functions or whatever else, are going to be type extensible to be able to handle both the original float64 and this new dual of float64. So there's still some amount of rewriting that you may have to use to handle these non-standard versions of this. In Julia, as an example, some versions of this include reverse diff.jl for reverse mode ID, forward diff.jl for forward mode ID. If you want to use C code, adept is an example of an operator overloading tool. And Jax is an example of this inside of Python that emulates NumPy style operations. Now we've modified our ReLU3 function, and most of these operator overloading tools, when you're doing reverse mode, have to first run a version of the computation where it looks at every single operation that you're doing and stores all of those operations that you're running on a new instruction tape. Then when I want to go ahead and compute the actual derivative, it interprets every single style of those instructions on the tape to be able to compute the overall derivative. And of course, doing this sort of dynamic recomputation and storing of values to be later interpreted in practice also can be quite slow. The third approach is known as source rewriting. Examples include kind of Zycode inside of Julia or specifically Julia IR, top non for C code, among a couple of others. The goal here is we're going to take in our original input program, statically analyze it, and emit now new source code that contains just the definitions of the gradient function. Unlike the previous one, you don't have to do any dynamic reinterpretation since in practice you can just go ahead and run the code. So of course there's gonna be some time for the sake of compilation. But in contrast, you also need to make sure that all of the code that you want to be able to run is available for these source rewriting tools. Now, regardless of which of these three style approaches that you go down, all of these tools tend to follow the same typical approach. So first I have my language, in this case, Julia. Um, we have our AD tool that's designed for that language. doesn't matter which of those three. And we emit new Julia code, and then we go down the typical compiler pipeline. In this case, the AD tool is specific both to the individual language and also operates entirely on the source code basically as written before it goes through any optimization procedures. Now, in practice, that's not necessarily the greatest thing. So we've got this magnitude function here that takes in a vector of float 64s and computes the magnitude in O of n time. And we have this normalized function that normalizes the vector in O of n squared time. Specifically, it's O of n squared time because we go through every index of the array and we also compute the magnitude there. And since this takes O of n time, we're doing that n times total runtime O of n squared. Now, any reasonable compiler worth its salt should be able to figure out for us that this magnitude function is the same in every iteration. It's able to hoist it out and reduce the runtime from O of n squared down to simply O of n, since we're only calling the magnitude function once. If we were able to have an AD tool that doesn't actually work 
like all those existing ones in practice, where those existing AD tools, again, have to operate before any optimizations come into play. Let's see how that magic AD tool might work. So once again, we have that original function, we optimize it, then we do AD on top of it. And the way that in this case, reverse mode AD works is in essence, whatever you had as your original code, you mirror it or you reverse it to compute the corresponding derivative. So whereas we had the magnitude function outside the loop to begin with, now we have the gradient magnitude function also at the end of the loop. But unfortunately, that isn't actually how these things are implemented in practice. These existing AD tools have to operate before any optimizations. We have this magnitude function, once again, inside the loop. We do the differentiation immediately now, and we have the gradient magnitude function, again, inside the loop. We can now see if we can run the optimization after the fact and hoist it outside, but it's not legal to do so, specifically because the gradient magnitude function actually calls uh, with this loop local variable dres, and since that variable is defined inside the loop, we can't hoist it outside the loop. So the real sort of moral from the story is that if you're able to, instead of those existing approaches, differentiate after optimization, you can potentially create asymptotically or just generally faster gradient code. And that's exactly what Enzyme is designed to do. Unlike those existing AD tools, which all operate one on an individual language and at the source level, the goal of Enzyme is to push differentiation as far back as possible. In particular, our goal is to be able to push inside of the LLVM intermediate representation, where a huge amount of all of these existing optimizations are done. Now, by working on the LLVM IR, we're now able to work alongside the optimization pipeline, and in particular, after existing optimizations are run. Also, as a neat side benefit, in addition to the fact that we're able to, of course, go ahead and say differentiate Julia code, but we're able to differentiate any code that's statically compilable down to LLVM. So we can differentiate C++ code, Fortran, Rust, Swift, whatever you like. As long as it's compilable <laughs> into LLVM, we're able to differentiate that LLVM. From here, the first result that we got, which was presented at NERVS 2020, is let's just do an ablation analysis of the effectiveness of running AD after optimization actually works in practice. So we took our original enzyme pipeline where we actually run optimizations first. And we also took a reference pipeline that tries to emulate the behavior of these other AD tools specifically by running immediately with no optimization running first. So if we compare both the enzyme pipeline and that previously mentioned reference pipeline, on average, we get a 4.2x speedup simply by running optimizations before any AD process. And if we look across this, which this is the Microsoft AD Bench suite, which is a relatively standard suite, which has some machine learning code, such as some LSTM bundle analysis and GMM. These pieces of code get a reasonable speed up 2x, say 2x, say like 5x or so. We also have some integrators. So we have an Euler integrator and an RK4 integrator, which has a bunch of like ex macro expansion template equivalent bits. And we see there's a really big gap right here, partially because there's a huge amount of things to go ahead and optimize inside of that through all those macro expansions and the like. Finally, we have both the FFT test and a Brussels Raider test. And it turns out an FFT was handwritten to be super duper optimized to begin with. So doing any additional optimization in the compiler prior to AD didn't make as much of a difference. Whereas here it makes a huge difference. And for your uh, typical machine learning codes, you make a still fairly sizable difference, leading to that 4.2x speed up on average. Now with that little intro to what Enzyme is generally, let's talk about Enzyme.jl since this is JuliaCon after all. What Enzyme.jl is specifically is its Julia bindings to the overall Enzyme AD framework, which again, recall, can work on any LVM-based language, not just Julia. The bindings themselves are actually built off of GPU Compiler.jl, which is a wonderful framework for doing general compilation, which includes, in this case, not just GPU code, but CPU and other neat pieces of code. Inside of Enzyme.jl, in particular, we expose both uh, forward mode AD and reverse mode AD. What's really neat about Enzyme.jl, specifically in a Julia context, is that unlike a lot of other AD tools, it's able to handle mutation, it's able to handle parallelism, both from a CPU context as well as from a, a GPU context, and in particular, both AMD and CUDA GPUs, as well as a lot of other pretty neat stuff. And as alluded to earlier, through the benefit of both static analysis and optimization, we're able to get very, very fast, in particular, on scalar AD codes. So we can actually take a look at how this works in practice and compare it against some of the existing tools in the Julia ecosystem. We have this simple Taylor series. You can run it within Enzyme for both forward mode and reverse mode, and you get roughly 30 milliseconds. And that's actually even faster, like the reverse mode of Enzyme is actually faster than calling the forward diff.jl is itself 
faster in this case than zygote, which is itself even faster than calling on diffractor. You can also compare this to the equivalent code inside of JAX, and it turns out to be a lot faster <laughs> than JAX in particular. Not only is the time here faster, but you'll note here that this order of number of iterations is one order less than all these other ones because it ran out of time to run, and this is the time that I cut it off at. The Python here code for JAX is shown as follows. JAX also has a high-level primitive for a for loop, which isn't exactly <laughs> what the style of code is for these other pieces, but if you chose to use that specific high-level primitive, you get something a lot faster, but still not nearly as fast as these other things, which is pretty neat. So talked a little bit earlier about all the cool sides of Enzyme. Now, of course, Enzyme is continuous work in progress. So there's naturally a couple of sharp bits. So as mentioned earlier, Enzyme is built off of GPU compiler jail, which gives it a lot of really neat stuff. But in contrast, there's a lot of stuff that also provides this limitation. So specifically, if you have any code that's GPU style code, in other words, there's no mutation, you tend not to use a lot of global variables, et cetera, that code tends to be relatively well-formed and easily differentiable by Enzyme. In contrast, if you have more generic or type unstable code, that's code that's not typically well handled by GPU compiler, which we're actually extending to be able to make sure that all of these things work inside of it. So the gist is, if you have code that's type stable and inside that sort of sphere, you're probably good off. But if you have anything with kind of stabilities, you're reaching the line where there'd be dragons and may not necessarily be full support yet, but we're continuing to add more support for that as time goes on. A couple of other things. There are some parts of Julia that tend to call into external libraries. We need the definition or a custom derivative equivalent of those to be able to go ahead and differentiate it. We have fallback support for typical blahs calls, but we haven't yet implemented that for lawpack, but Hopefully there's a PR outstanding for that and that'll eventually come. Similarly, uh, we don't actually integrate right now with chain rules. All of the derivatives are actually generated from the LVM IR itself, as opposed to someone having to go and manually specify the derivative for all of those pieces. So if you try to use say a chain rule style rule and it doesn't get registered, it's because it doesn't use chain rules right now. There's actually some ongoing work on a precursor chain rule style system with an enzyme called enzyme rules, which Hopefully we'll eventually hook up with that, but currently doesn't exist and will hopefully relatively soon in the future. Moreover, uh, if you do use certain styles of internal allocations in the functions that you're trying to go ahead and differentiate, we don't yet have full support for all the types of things inside of Julia's garbage collector. So if you use certain types of allocations inside the function that you're trying to differentiate, you may hit that in-progress support, which is not yet fully supported as Julia's garbage collector has a lot of really interesting things that I'm sure someone else at JuliaCon can talk at length about some of those interesting pieces. A couple of other relatively interesting bits. Enzyme is one of the first tools actually to be able to differentiate in reverse mode arbitrary GPU kernels. And that actually turns out to be because differentiating arbitrary GPU kernels is really, really hard. And there's three reasons for this. The first of which is just generically differentiating parallelism itself even independent of the GPU is hard and can quickly lead to incorrect results. Second reason for which is that there's very complex performance characteristics on the GPU that can make it relatively difficult to synthesize efficient code to run on the GPU. And moreover, there's very specific requirements on what is the total amount of things that you're allowed to use on the GPU that if you exceed that, it'll prevent your GPU kernel from running at all. Talking just about parallelism to begin with, imagine we have here this sample code that does a parallel four across one through 10 iterations. And for every iteration sets an index of an array to equal the same value. Now, this value is read in every single iteration, which is completely fine since there's no potential contention on top of it besides the fact that all the threads would read across it. So in some sense, this is a read race or a concurrent read, however you'd like to say it. The problem though, is if you want to go ahead and do the derivative of it, you'd see that you'd have the corresponding reverse pass parallel for loop. Unfortunately, now, as we're adding up the deriv partial derivatives into the differential deval, whereas we had a concurrent read in the forward pass, we now have a concurrent write in the reverse pass. And if you have multiple things that try to write into the same location at once in parallel, you will quickly get wrong answers. The second of these problems, as alluded to earlier, is that the GPU has very specific constraints on the types of things that you're allowed to use and the types of things that are fast in order to use. So on the GPU, there tend to be three different styles of memory that people like to talk about. The first of which are registers. Those are per thread. There's not a lot of them, but they're super duper fast. So everything that you can put inside of registers, you want to be able to do so. There's one caveat to that though, which is if you use too many registers at the same time, it limits the number of things that you can run in parallel. So keeping that in mind, 
having as much inside of registers as possible will make your code run exceedingly fast. The second type of memory is known as shared memory. So whereas registers, you couldn't actually see data from one thread to another, shared memory actually allows you to do that within a specific group of threads. There's a lot more of it. There's now on the order of, say, kilobytes as opposed to on the order of bytes. Like that previous requirement for registers, if you use too much shared memory, it'll limit the total number of things that can run in parallel. And still moderately fast, not nearly as fast as using just registers, but if you do need to do some sort of communication across different threads or you just need more memory, shared memory is a good place to do it. Global memory is the final type of memory that people tend to care about on GPUs. It's a lot more of it on the order of gigabytes. Uh, if I were to say buy a uh, new 3090 and NVIDIA advertises to me, you got 12 gigabytes of memory on your GPU. They mean you have 12 gigabytes of global memory. There's a lot more of it, obviously, and it can be seen and used by everyone, which is pretty nice, but it tends to be very, very slow. And a lot of typical kernels, especially if that haven't necessarily been super duper performance engineered, tend to be bottlenecked by the total number of reads and writes to global memory. So if you do want to write a fast program, you want to shove most of your work from the right side into the left side type of memory as possible, and then you'll end up with a more reasonably efficient kernel. And the way that we actually go ahead and resolve those two problems of both the parallelism as well as the memory hierarchy is actually to solve them together. So specifically, if you already have that super duper fast thread local memory, we can also give you a super duper fast way of resolving the races, which is there is no race. So we can just do a non-atomic load and store, and that's the fastest thing that you can do. Now, if you have the same memory location across all threads, as an example, sometimes it's straight memory, you can actually do a parallel reduction, which, well, again, not nearly as fast as just a non-atomic load and store, since there is some amount of communication here, still is moderately efficient to be able to go ahead and run. And finally, if you have something else where you have no idea what's going on, as an example, uh, as is the case with, say, global memory, you can always fall back to an atomic load and store and it'll maintain correctness. And the sort of like key takeaway here is, assuming you had a fast program to begin with, then you'll also end up with a reasonably fast derivative to begin with because the similar properties where you try to shove most of your stuff into the faster memory means that you'll have most of your work again now in a faster way of resolving races. Now, we took all of that stuff and wrote a whole suite of both AD-specific and GPU-specific optimizations where the full list is actually in our GPU paper in SC of uh, 2021. And we actually show that through the use of not just those pre-existing LVM optimizations, but these novel AD and GP specific optimizations are actually able to speed up the runtime of these differentiated kernels by several orders of magnitude, and more specifically, prevent them from just instantly ooming as soon as you try to run it. So in this benchmark suite of six large scale benchmarks, including both AMD or Rockham and CUDA or NVIDIA kernels, as well as both Julia and say C++ as language inputs, five out of the six of these large scale benchmarks oom or otherwise fail to run instantly if you don't turn on any optimization and thus turning on optimization lets you actually have your code run. We have a couple of examples here of how you might go ahead and run it, again, both for CUDA.jl and AMD.jl. The full version of these codes are available at the link on GitHub below. And we have a lot of other really fun ongoing and upcoming work. So not only did we handle all the wonderful types of GPU parallels on, but we actually extended it. And since we're already inside of a common core infrastructure, we can develop a common core infrastructure for any type of parallelism, be it GPU parallelism, uh, CPU thread parallelism, distributed or like MPI style parallelism, uh, where the, the gist is you basically want to reverse the dependency structures. And then as long as you have nice things for both caching and race resolution, you can generalize that. This work is actually going to appear at SC22. So if you want to handle some wonderful MPI, Julia tasks, at threads, we got you. Thank you so much. Okay. So, Krishna. Um, yeah, so there is a question, are packages like linear algebra and other things in the STD lib differentiable by enzymes? So I don't know about STD lib, but I can talk about linear algebra. I know that uh, there's support coming in uh, in enzyme for BLAS and LAPAC and so on. And once it's there in, um, in enzyme proper, it will be coming to enzyme.jl as well. And I think that was the only question. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, kick you out, Chris, and add uh, Michelle. Thank you. Hello. Hi.
Uh, Michel is a computer scientist at Argonne National Lab, and he's going to talk about autodiff extensions for numerical simulations in Julia. Over to you, Michel. Yeah, our mission in uh, the DJ First project was to do autodiff plus X. So, uh, what is meant by that? Julia, from very early on, had great AD support. It had uh, forward diff, reverse diff uh, in very early versions. And uh, then came Zygote, Diffractor we have today, and uh, there are also other new AD tools coming along. But the question was, what if suppose you have an AD tool, what else do you need in order to differentiate the kind of codes that we have uh, 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 in this uh, symposium? And has been, as the previous talk has been about enzyme, um, it turns out that we will probably be using uh, Enzyme a lot. And that's why also Valentin and Billy are on this talk too, since they helped us out uh, whenever we had to interface with the um, AD tool. Um, also, summer student Shreyas uh, joined this project for this summer and uh, helped us out develop an example code. Um, so what are extensions for AD? What do you mean by that? So you have an AD uh, tool and then you want to, for instance, uh, do uh, activity analysis. Um, so which um, computational paths of your code are actually active and need to be differentiated. This is being taken care of by Enzyme. Then we have object mutation. We will come to that uh, in the next slides, but this is also taken care of by Enzyme right now. And uh, adjoint checkpointing. So this has been mentioned now several times uh, by Nora, Chris, and maybe also another talk that seems to be really for climate models as a time dependent problem being one of the core issues that you uh, um, iterate over time and then you compute the adjoint in the reverse order and you, as Billy said, will oom uh, very quickly and run out of memory. Um, then sparse derivatives, so how do you do, uh, suppose you want to compute the full sparse Jacobian and then you want to apply coloring, compress your Jacobian and compute it in a uh, compressed way in order to uh, increase efficiency. Um, parallelism, also there, Enzyme uh, has pretty much our back. Um, non Non-smooth computation is another topic that we may look into uh, once we have real simulations running. Um, so what has been done so far? We focused on checkpointing. We have released a check, uh, checkpointing package, checkpointing.jl. And we, uh, what is in the AD community, the uh, state-of-the-art coloring library is Callpack, And we ported that to no, we didn't port that to Julia. We interfaced it to Julia, so you can use it uh, by just adding uh, the callback package. And um, uh, it has the same interface as uh, the one in the uh, sparse diff tools. So let's uh, get to adjoint checkpointing. Uh, I mean, the issue has been explained before. You uh, have a time-dependent problem. You iterate uh, forward um, from uh, step zero to step n or nine. Then you reverse, and you have to restore all these previously computed uh, states. And this takes a lot of memory, or potentially takes a lot of memory. Um, here we have uh, an example of Hicopolis where uh, binomial checkpointing was successfully applied to compute really long time horizons. Um, so our goal is to support general numerical simulation codes and make it available to the Julia community so that they can use checkpointing very easily in their simulation codes. Our initial focus would, of course, be the, the climate simulation codes that we have in this project. Simple things should be simple. So a user who doesn't understand adjoint checkpointing or even doesn't know about adjoints should, have, should, be, it, it should be very easy for him to just add uh, the decorator in the code and get the checkpointing that he wants on the hardware that he targets. He or she. Um, then um, um, we use Julia uh, code transformation macros. So we transform a loop into a checkpointing loop 
so that uh, you have a time dependent loop, it then becomes the uh, a, a loop that computes the forward and the reverse adjoint and checkpoint. We also want to support a, ver a variety of checkpointing schemes. So there's not only the one checkpointing scheme that uh, that is uh, that wins them all, so rules them all. Um, there are different kinds of checkpointing schemes which have different um, um, advantages, disadvantages, depending on which device you want to use. And this brings us then also to uh, the feature that we want to support uh, that we uh, can store checkpoints on multiple devices, maybe in GPU memory, RAM, local disk. Um, so local disk on a, a HPC cluster, meaning on the node, or on the system disk, or even checkpoint all the way back to archive. Uh, imagine if you have a run that goes on for um, a few days, weeks. So what are all the checkpoint, uh, checkpointing schemes about? Well, checkpointing schemes are about a trade-off of um, recomputation and uh, storage needs. In periodic checkpointing, for instance, you see we uh, checkpoint at every second time step. So we have one, two, three, four, five checkpoints. And then we do the augmented forward run and the reverse run. And this is always the same. You always have the same number of aug augmented forward and reverse runs. Where the schemes differ are these additional brown arrows that you get for recomputing until the point where you start the augmented forward run. And binomial checkpointing has been shown to be uh, um, optimal for, I know this is no, this is binomial checkpointing, yeah. You see that it only uses three checkpoints, so you preset a fixed number of checkpoints that you want to use, and it will spread them in a way that is very efficient and reduces the number of re, uh, recomputations. Um, two observations that we made while developing our checkpointing library that we want to integrate in, in, in the codes. First one is that most Julia tools, if not nearly all of them, don't support uh, mutable objects, so mutable arrays in the, in the most simple term. Um, but simulation codes are often written that way, so this looks very Fortran-y. This, this is because it is ported from a Fortran code and you just change uh, certain elements of an array, but not you, you don't reallocate the entire uh, 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 array to create a new one. Um, so this does not work with most AD tools, whereas uh, this code, which creates a new array on every change in the former array, um, this works fine. And the reason for that is that most uh, AD tools in Julia were developed in times where machine learning was the main focus. And in machine learning, where you just propagate through the layers and then go reverse, you indeed do not need uh, mut mutation necessarily. Although maybe today's research is also looking into, into, into those issues and to implement also checkpointing it right into machine learning. The second observation was that uh, all our codes that we use as an example, so DJ used by Mathieu, Lulesh, uh, which we used as a um, uh, code to uh, um, demonstrate enzyme, and Oceanigans, they all use the same Y loop where they essentially start at a time and they uh, stop at a time, which is often unknown. Um, so the number of time steps are unknown. The time is known in uh, in seconds, but you don't know how many time steps you're going to need to reach that uh, simulation time. So all these codes use, use a while loop, and all these codes go over a uh, struct. So you have a domain, a sim, or a FEM model struct, which has all the information that the model needs, and then you compute the next time step and you get uh, the, the new state out. So storing the entire struct overestimates probably the entire state. You don't have to store everything. Like for instance, integer values um, don't necessarily need to be stored. Uh, however, this can be fully automated. So that's what we are aiming for, that we just, take a struct, we checkpoint that entire struct, sequentialize it, write it out to disk or whatever, 
and um, uh, uh, store uh, the entire state to make it as automated as possible. Um, yeah, and these are then our needs for this project. So it should be fully automated of while loops with trucks, uh, mutation should work. And that's why we are using en Enzyme for most of this, because Enzyme has uh, this uh, neat abstraction where it can differentiate structs. So in Enzyme, you don't have to have a variable. You just uh, give it an, uh, a struct, uh, in input struct, output struct, and it will differentiate all the derivatives with respect to everything uh, in those structs. And uh, how are we going to embed uh, ad adjoint checkpointing in Julia? Um, so checkpointing scheme, a checkpointing scheme is just another function. And the loop that is being uh, differentiated is also just a function. So we can um, incorporate all that into the chain rules.jl package. We can just define a, a rule for our checkpointing function and um, then uh, apply that in the in the differentiated code. Um, we have then a, a function checkpoint struct where all whether you have a for loop, a while loop, everything will be um, uh, mapped to this checkpoint struct function, uh, which has a primal struct and then an adjoint struct, which is um, uh, the terminology used from Enzyme, which is the uh, shadow struct, which has all the uh, adjoint information in it. And by defining a um, chain rule such a rule, we now have all that covered. We every AD tool that now uses chain rules dot will work with our checkpointing library and will work with all the schemes that are Im 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 implemented there. Um, so. How to install checkpointing.jl? It's in the official uh, uh, release repo, uh, package repo. So you just add checkpointing. Uh, it supports revolve, which is shown to be optimal under certain assumptions, like that writing and reading to memory uh, has, has no cost. Um, Periodic checkpointing, so at every period you do a uh, checkpoint. This is, for instance, useful if you write asynchronously to disk and you just want to write out as much as possible. So at every period you write out uh, a uh, state to uh, disk. And then it also has now uh, online revolve, which uh, is used if you do not know a, a, a priori how many time steps you are going to do. So this was very important for us to support that very early on, since all the three example codes uh, would, uh, would need this. Then um, in addition to doing the checkpointing in memory, so storing the entire struct just in memory, we also added HDF5 support, since that seems to be the straightforward target most large uh, computer system supports HDF5. Most numerical simulation codes work with, with the HDF5. And it has, interestingly to me, since I have myself not really uh, extensively used it, uh, support for multi-level caching. So you, 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 you get certain features that we want to have in, uh, in checkpointing.gl, you get uh, for uh, free through, through HDF5. Like you can pre-cache uh, certain uh, checkpoints into RAM uh, and load them from, from, from disk before they are used. Um, so fully automated uh, checkpointing is now possible if the body of the loop can be differentiated using enzyme.jl and the outer code outside of the loop can be differentiated by any AD tool that supports chain, chain rules.jl and also assuming that that tool then can differentiate that code. Um, if you manu manually write um, uh, storing and restore functions, you, uh, we currently support all the AD tools. Um, so our tests currently uh, run over Diffractor, Enzyme, Reverse Diff, and, and Zygots. 
still, I would qualify the entire code still as fragile. So you probably run into issues if you, if, you, if you use it straight away on your code. And we are happy if you submit issues on, the, on, uh, on our GitHub page. As an example, um, so these are the examples that we work with, not these nice coloring graphs of oceans, but one the heat equation. And um, we do 500 time steps. Uh, we have a boundary condition on the left of 20 degrees, uh, temperature, whatever, and zero on the other end. And uh, then we, uh, we initialize all the temperatures to zero and we let the simulation run for 500 time steps. So before it reach, reaches the uh, uh, steady state, and uh, then you get the nice gradient out here on the right. And this is implemented in the example. Um, so what you have to do then is you have your struct uh, heat where all the information is stored. So the previous time step, the next time step, uh, or current time, time step, um, the size, lambda, and the number of time steps. So this is our struct that we have defined. Um, set the boundary conditions, and then you have you define your checkpointing scheme, and you have to give it the struct type, so heat in this case, and it will generate all this uh, how to store, restore, and how to apply the chain rule, rule, and all of that will be automatically generated. Uh, and then you just can call uh, zygote gradient of the sum of the heat. So here's the sum heat function. Uh, it has the advanced uh, function, which advances the, the, the heat equation one, one time step and uh, does that for a certain number of time steps and then just reduces uh, uh, all the heat, so sums all the heat up. Um, yeah, and that is all that you have to do. So you add this checkpoint struct macro, you pass it the revolve uh, data structure that you have created for this case. Um, so this can also be flexible. You can have multiple checkpointing schemes and then just pass here in whatever you want to di uh, di uh, dynamically at runtime. And um, then, um, of course, the uh, heat uh, uh, object has to be passed too. So now Zygote differentiates the outer, so the reduction effectively only, and enzyme differentiates the inner part of, of, of this loop. Um, so the outlook for fully automated differentiation, we need two things. We need support of chain rules for enzyme, which was mentioned in Billy's talk. So enzyme rules, we are working on, on, on that. So that is really our next focus to get that off the ground so that you can really use whatever AD tool uh, wherever you uh, like, in the inner loop, outer loop. Um, so for support of struct differentiation, we haven't gotten it off the ground yet. So that's why enzyme can only be used in the inner, in the inner loop. Um, I tried to implement it using Zygote. Maybe I'm doing also something wrong. Happy to uh, get comments on that. Um, uh, how to apply other AD tools to differentiate, uh, how to make them differentiate structs or what else is needed to achieve that. Um, so a workaround or not really a workaround, but you can generate or uh, write custom store and restore functions and then everything works with all AD tools. Uh, in terms of application goal, we want to differentiate uh, uh, a simple M MPI parallelized ice sheet model and show that it can run on a, on a large system and that we can checkpoint the various devices at the various levels in the memory uh, hierarchy. Um, so yeah, that, 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 is our, uh, uh, that is what we are looking as a main outcome for uh, next year. Then coloring, um, brief, look at coloring, what we have done there. We release callpack.jl, which has a, um, uh, several graph coloring algorithms that have shown in the ID community to be really uh, pretty, um, uh, I mean, the best, the state, state of, of the art 
algorithms that are out there. Um, we have exported the API to match the 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 one of Sparstiff tools. So and you and we use the binary builder to so that you download automatically the binary of Callpack and you can just use this use it straight away and play with Callpack. There are certain features and uh, coloring tools that we still want to add, so they will come when there's more interest into coloring. And why uh, did that stall a bit? Because we tested it on our, so we have power system problems that we can apply this to, which are small and structured graph problems. And we, we observed that at both Sparstiff tools and Callpack find the optimal coloring. So there's no real need for using Callpack there. However, in these applications here, we expect that if you have a, a sparse Jacobian problem where you want to compute the full sparse Jacobian, that Callpack will be useful, and we are looking forward to uh, to uh, to uh, this. And this is it. Thank you very much. I think you're muted. <laughs> I have a newfound respect for TV producers. Um, so there's a question uh, on pigeonhole. Uh, would the 1D heat formulated in Oceanigans and DJuice be a good setup for testing integration and it's possible and is it's possible in both tools? Heat equation implemented in DJuice or Oceanigans, effectively. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, fully understand the question. So there is uh, a one D heat formulation in Ocean and Against. Ah, and so yes. Uh, we we didn't we 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 want to target an ice sheet model simply because that is what also the applications uh, side. I mean, the application people want to uh, target. So the heat equation here was really just randomly picked because that's in general an example that is often used in the AD community. Right, but. But presumably, you could also do that with Oceanigans and yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you so much again. And I will now hand over to Chris Rakakas. I will remove you first, Michelle. <coughs> and add Chris. Oh, Chris is good to go. OK, uh, just a word about Chris. Chris is the co-PI of the Julia Lab at MIT, uh, the lead developer of the SciML open source software organization, amongst his many, many qualifications. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, I wanted to give a brief status on uh, update of AD for SciML applications in Julia, right? So we've seen a lot of this lower level about what happens if people are trying to write their own equation solvers and such. But you know, when you, when you get to this higher level, how does this actually translate to tools that are then you you know built and used by by all everyone else in the in the community, right? You know, how how has this DJ for Earth then impacted everyone else? Um, I want to mention that there's a lot of major contributors to the SIML sensitivity whole ecosystem, especially Yingbo, Frank, uh, Avik, and Arno. Um, and and so really, you know, let me let me start by saying um, this is not going to be a talk on SIML in general. If you want me to, if you want to see a talk all about you know the latest in mixing models and data, check out this this talk on YouTube. Right, that's uh, there, there's a standard talk I'll, I give, so I'll I'll skip over that for now. Um, so let me let me first start out with a lightning fast motivation for why we want to do this differentiable simulation, right? So there's been a lot of other things that have been come that have come up in this you know world of you know things like deep O nets and neural networks on the on the outside with physics informed neural networks. So why has there been a really a push, especially in the last year, back towards differentiable simulation? Um, I think that this is very well highlighted by a case on an ocean model. So um, we had a case where we wanted to develop a you know better parameterizations of, a, of this ocean model. So it'd be able to find a one-dimensional partial differential equation that would capture the physics of this three-dimensional PDE, just what is the average heat flow in the up and down range. Um, it turns out that if you try to do this in such a way where you say, I'm going to try to find a closure model and I want to nudge my data around, so that way I'm looking at the derivatives, I, I find out what you know what the derivative should be. I check out, okay, now I, I take my der derivative data. The derivative data up is like this. You know, but the, then I have a residual. If you then try to make this this neural network directly match the residual values, uh, you get something that doesn't fit very well, right? 
So, and this is something that you can do in any language. You can do this with, say, you know, PyTorch. There's no differential differentiation in the simulator here. If you take the fact that you know that you're supposed to be fitting derivatives, you nudge all your data so that way you have derivative information, you find out what the the the, the uh, residual is here, and you directly fit the data, you know, data set to neural network, right? Um, but this does not turn out to work out so well. The reason is because if you only try to control the derivative of a process that's evolving over time, you will naturally get a drift over time, right? So what you want to do instead of controlling derivatives only is you also want to do integral control, which essentially corresponds to using the solution to your uh, to your to the model with the neural networks embedded in it. You want to use that within your loss function, which naturally means that your entire simulator is in your loss function, and so therefore you have to differentiate it, right? So this is what brings us to differentiable simulation, along with a lot of other things where if you show, if you look at, say, physics-informed neural networks versus a differentiable simulation approach, there's about a 10,000 to 100,000 times difference where, if, you know, Fourier neural operators, heap O nets, and physics-informed neural networks are much slower than an optimized differentiable simulator. You can go check out one of my other talks that describes all of, all of that in detail. But um, so th this brings us to differentiating simulators, right? But you know, differentiable, differentiating simulators is all about adjoints. So why is automatic differentiation important if we're just using the adjoint method, right? So uh, how the adjoint method, you know, there, first of all, there isn't just one thing that's the adjoint method, right? You, you can mathematically say that there's one adjoint method, but if you actually go and practice and come up with implementations, there's about nine different adjoint methods, or there's about, well, you can actually come up with a whole grid of 27 different uh, adjoint methods given different choices you can make, but there's about nine of those that are useful, right? Now, the, the key about the, these adjoint methods, right, when we talk about doing adjoint methods, you know, you actually write down an equation. So you, you, you know, if you're solving an ODE, the derivative to an ODE is solving a different ODE. But that ODE that you're solving actually need has, you know, you write that in and then you solve that using your solver. And so, you know, Julie is not the first to, to offer that. So, you know, there's other large scale sparse distributed libraries. So there's other libraries that have these large scale uh, stiff ODE solvers developed for, you know, partial differential equations. So, uh, and they also have adjoint techniques. So, you know, sundials can have adjoints. Um, Pet C can have adjoints. Um, and, but, you know, sundials ha, you know, or, or in Julia, the, the Julia CIML ones, it has, you know, the adjoints with checkpointing and sparse automatic differentiation, everything baked into it. So if you're using a sparse Jacobian on a huge PDE, you get that checkpointing and everything automatically. You get that sparsity handling automatically. But the real big differentiator from, from the Julia side to the classical C++ libraries is that the automatic differentiation is baked in. And, you know, and so even though, and the reason why this is important is because calculating the derivative to an ODE is just, just solving another ODE. So you, you might assume that if you have an, a, a good ODE solver, then you can do this effectively. But the issue is that the definition of that ODE that you have to solve actually has something in here that is a vector Jacobian product. And this vector Jacobian product can it can be calculated without forming the Jacobian only if you allow yourself automatic differentiation in the way this function is defined, right? So even if you have a way to generate adjoints, that does not necessarily mean that you have a way to, to generate the adjoint equation in a way that is uh, efficient. You have to have automatic differentiation as part of that uh, code generation process in order to do that. And that's where Julia really shines um, from, from where the, the, the previous tools were. And now, you know, how, how that is done really matters. Uh, we've, we've now shown, for example, that, you know, doing this with Enzyme is about two orders of magnitude faster than a lot of the other tools that we're using in Julia before. So, uh, you know, how do, how, do, how, do, how do we take this and over the last year, make this package SIML sensitivity and make this truly automatic for users, right? So this is all about the SenseAlg interface. If you, and really the key is that if you just stick a, a solve, right? So if you stick an ODE solve inside of a loss function and you say you calculate a derivative, um, it will make use of automatic differentiation overloads. So that way this will be done effectively. So you, you, you know, with forward mode, you just stick solve inside of a loss function, you're good. Uh, with uh, re reverse mode, you just stick solve inside of a loss function, you're good. So, you know, basically what, what you know, there is no automatic differentiation that you need to directly think about with solve. You know, the, the way that this is done is that when a, when a automatic differentiation library sees the ODE solve, it will replace it with adjoints automatically, 
right? So it does this, it does this change to create this equation, solve it in reverse, everything. That's all done automatically underneath the hood. Now, the key here is that you know you, you can actually choose, right? I mentioned that there's many different adjoint methods. The way that the SciML, uh, the SciML interface works is that there's a keyword argument, senseAlg, which is only captured when it's in an automatic differentiation context. And when you're in an automatic differentiation context, it uses this to figure out, uh, this senseAlg argument to figure out what kind of, of uh what kind of adjoint method should I do, right? So what adjoint method should I do? And what are the options for that adjoint method? So this is how you would be able to turn on checkpointing, turn off checkpointing, turn on, you know, mixing in forward mode and all these other options happen through the, the choice of sense out, right? And now this has been around for, for a few years now, but what we've really done is we've expanded it to all sorts of equation solvers. So here, for example, is a nonlinear problem solved with the newton rapson method. And here you see that, hey, we, you, know, you just call solve, um, and then there's a steady state adjoint with the auto jack vec of enzyme VJP. So this, is, this means that you know, if you wanna use a Newton method, this will run a Newton's method and it will use enzyme for the code that it generates and it will use you know, the adjoint method on the outside for, for, the, for the actual solve it generates. So this is just done all automatically. In fact, if you do not pass a senseAlg algorithm, it has a way to automatically choose a default senseAlg, in which case it'll, for this equation, it'll actually choose this, this uh, approach as the default, right? So if you just stick, you know, nonlinear solve or, or, or differential equations inside of a loss function, and you just call it and say differentiate, these adjoint methods are done automatically along with implicit function theory. All the things that you mentioned uh, that we saw in the earlier talks are now integrated into the tooling. So that way they're just done automatically. Those, those tricks are part of the library. Um, now, how far have we gotten with this? I will say that not all of the equation solver libraries uh, handle this. Uh, the two to highlight are linearsolve.jl and optimization.jl are the two that are notably need uh, more adjoint support. Uh, though nonlinear solvers, uh, the, all the differential equation solvers, integrals, and a lot of the partial differential equation interface uh, does this the, does this integration automatically. Um, these next two bits are two of the higher priority things in the SciML universe right now. Um, and what this really means then is that you know the the SciML interface is really growing in its interfaces, which. I'm gonna, I have another talk at JuliaCon that will talk all about linearsolve.jl. And so once that handling for the adjoints is on linearsolve.jl, then all of these different solvers, including Sweet Sparse, Pardizo, you know, in, uh, as we're mix, making it do at pet C and everything, all of those are just handled automatically by using the linearsolve.jl interface, right? And if you want to ha make sure that you're using the implicit function theorem with all of the you know, enzyme and everything automatically, well, if you use nonlinear solve, then you have all those uh, adjoints automatically applied. But if you, you know, what is nonlinear solve? Well, nonlinear solve has some of its own methods, but it also is minpack, sundials, nlsolve.jl, and steady state diffiq.jl for mixing in uh, pseudo transient methods. So it basically has, you know, it, it, so basically there's these growing interfaces where if you use this interface, not only do you have more algorithms available and you have, you know, and you have consistency among the arguments and everything, but you also have, you know, a consistent way to be able to choose how the adjoints are generated through the senseAlg interface, and you have the optimality of the adjoint implementations. Um, this is then done over the integral libraries with integrals.jl, right? So all the ways of doing cubature and all that. And then optimization.jl has a whole bunch of optimization libraries. This still needs the, the AD overload, but that's coming within the next month. Um, so, so okay, so so that's uh, let, now. Now let me get into the details of EJP, right? So you just slap solvers around. They now are generating uh, adjoint. They are now using adjoint methods under the hood everywhere. But what about this VJP thing, right? So um, the the senseAlg interface. The nice thing that's about it is that optimized adjoints are enabled by default. This makes it so that way wrap solvers such as Pet C, Cuba, uh, Sundials. These are all supported without user intervention, just by using the SciML interfaces. Um, it's all part of the SciML interface, so all of the you know all the tolerance definitions are uniform, all of the uh, options are uniform, right? We be, we use the same naming between ODEs, optimization, and nonlinear solving, so that because we have this uniformity, 
Um, and many of the highest performing solvers are actually only available through the SIML interface, you know, because a lot of them are developed in, in, as pure Julia. Now, the, the con of the SenseLog interface is that it, it exists, it requires that there exists a VJP to handle your problem definition. I'll mention this in a sec. And the issue is that it only works with chain rules on the outside, uh, chain rules AD on the outside, which means that even if it's using Enzyme on the inside, you need to make sure that you're using Zygote or Diffractor on the outside, at least for now. Um, and, and you know, so because so, what do I mean by this? So the VJP is this operation in here. It's it's the generation, it's the code generation step of what code are you going to put into that adjoint to solve, right? And it doesn't matter if it, if it's an ODE, you solve another ODE. If it's a nonlinear solve, you solve a nonlinear solve. But all all equation types always have a vector Jacobian product in the equation that you generate. And so there's always this question of how should I use reverse mode automatic differentiation in that code generation process? Um, and what we do is, you know, we, we have this whole sense alc interface so that way you can then say, oh, with this method, I want to use a sensitivity algorithm and for sensitivity algorithms, you can choose whether I want to use, you know, which VJP you want to use. And we don't supply it, it does something by default. What it does is, is, is a poly algorithm. So for example, it knows that for a given solver class, there's a cutoff where if the solver, you know, if you're solving a nonlinear system and it's less than 50 uh, parameters, then you do use forward mode automatic differentiation uh, for the VJP, right? So you construct the Jacobian and you transpose it because that's actually faster. You can see our benchmarks on that. But if you're above that level, then what it'll do is it'll try to use enzyme. If it can't use enzyme, then it'll use reverse diff with tape compilation if it can prove that you don't have branches inside of your code. How does it prove that it doesn't have branches inside of your code? It uses cassette to actually look at your Julia code, try to find any branches, and, it, it, and it's conservative. So if it finds anything that it doesn't understand, or if it finds a branch, then it says I can't do this. Um, if it can't do that, then it uses no tape compilation, right? So there's a very extensive poly algorithm for house and choosing what AD mechanism to use in this code generation, but this is all but done by default. You, you, you can directly choose which algorithm you want to use, but in these days, it's usually best for users just to leave it alone and let the poly algorithm do its, do its trick. Um, because there's there's a whole bunch of different ways that the VJP can be done, which mix different performance support and, and other limitations. Um, now, the the current difficulty with that you can run into is the fact that there's no VJP that kind of covers all of the cases. So, so where we are right now is that Enzyme is going to be default. Um, which means that it's tried first, right? So we, if we see that your code is, you know, trying to mutate, then what we'll do, you know, so we do a code inspection. If we see that it's trying to mutate, we say, aha, we're going to try enzyme on here. That's that's our default, right? We we always try to for all these adjuncts that we generate for sense algs and uh, with integrals, with uh, ODEs, with nonlinear solve, we try enzyme first. But um, and. If you've already written actually really good code, so if you've written non-allocating type stable PDE codes, you get really fantastic code, right? You get code that is really fast, uh, greatly outperforms tools like Jax, as as uh, as um, Billy mentioned in, in the Enzyme talk, right? There's it's not even close. Like this is very very good, very good performance. Um, and the nice thing too is that Enzyme, if it can't differentiate something, it just always throws you here. It's a very safe uh, thing. Now, the difficulty with it right now that some of you may have run into is that if Enzyme is tried, every once in a while, it throws errors at the LLVM level that are not caught at the Julia level, which to a Julia user will look like a seg fault because that can kill your Julia REPL. Um, and so we, when we do this try-catch approach of being like, hey, can Enzyme do this? Every once in a while, it actually causes Julia to fail. Um, that's why you might see a seg fault every once in a while. And please open up an issue. Really, all that this requires is it requires us to find the different cases that Enzyme isn't throwing it as a Julia level error, and then one by one, just make sure that all those turn to Julia level errors. If that's the case, then, you know, this, this algorithm of, you know, try, try Enzyme, then, then try something else, you know, with these different fallbacks, then it works out. The current difficulty here is that sometimes when it tries this, it hits this, this error that it's not able to recover from. And so if we help Enzyme find what the, all those pieces are, then this, this, uh, this VJP choice becomes a lot more robust. Um, now, the other thing is that Enzyme still has limited support for Julia's runtime, which means that it's, it's support for uh, dynamic dispatches, uh, like typed instabilities and garbage, garbage collection is still kind of uh, small. 
Um, that is definitely growing over time. But for right now, what we kind of, you know, the reason why this 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 whole system is set up is really because those cases aren't caught well by enzyme. And so sometimes we need to move to reverse diff or, or zygote to be able to handle those cases. Um, so the, the TLDR with it is if you've written like a very fast non-allocating PDE code, uh, it's you know, it will pretty much always automatically choose enzyme for you. You know, the differentiation that you get is really amazing. Um, the diff the bad part is that if you've written a bad code, so one that is, you know, type unstable or, or, or causing a lot of allocations, then, uh, then you, it won't hit enzyme and then you have less performance and, you know, you have other difficulties. Um, this would the reason why this kind of shows up as a real issue and that you see a lot of issues on discourse is that well the people who tend to write really really good codes tend to be the people who also know how to debug things well which means that we're in this kind of bad situation where the people who the people who uh, you know ha are are not as good at writing like really good performant code are also the ones that get the the AD issues uh, that they have to post to discourse to kind of figure out oh why does this VJP issue show up. Um, also code that mixes ML kinds of has some of these difficulties as well in certain cases. So this is, this is really what, what we're working on. We're working with the enzyme developers to kind of showcase all the different cases where VJPs generally fail and kind of work on those over time. Um, but really what, what we're, what we're ending up with is a composable infrastructure where, you know, we have tools for generating for, for PDEs that generate ODEs and, you know, the ODE solvers hit the optimization.jl and they use nonlinear solve and linear solve under the hood, which all have the right adjoints defined. And so everything really just builds up itself to be able to build, you know, this, this composable system where everything has adjoints already defined on it, um, as long as it's using these higher level interfaces of, of SciML. Um, and with that, we see a whole lot of performance benefits that have come, it's even, especially within the last year, we've seen a lot, thanks to um, integrating Enzyme as now one of the default choices throughout the ecosystem. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for a great talk. Um, I'm not seeing questions yet on Pigeonhole or on YouTube, but I do, do want to ask, are, other than branching um, type instabilities and allocations, are you... Is there anything else that a sort of someone trying to sort of differentiate uh, using enzyme should watch out for? And is this documented somewhere as they get started with differentiating codes through enzyme? Yeah, I mean, so, so I will I will say that you know when you're, I will say that these days I um, for the most part you just shouldn't choose a, a vector Jacobian product algorithm. Just kind of let that be under the hood. So you know for 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 the most part. You know, just just let it do its thing. But if you want to help out the development, right, then you can directly choose a VJP algorithm. And then if you if you do that directly, then you might see like, hey, you know, this would have failed, and then it would have gone to a, a slower method. Um, and the reason why it's gone to the slower method normally comes down to some yeah, garbage collection, dynamic dispatch, or something. Uh, I guess the thing that I missed was a uh, uh, support for for linear algebra missing, right? We, you know, some. I think that mat moles are handled now, but uh, if you have, say, an LU factorization inside of your ODE solve or an LU factorization inside of the right-hand side of your of your Newton method, right, um, those are the things that can make uh, enzyme uh, not work, and then it will fall back to reverse diff, and you might take a performance hit or something. Um, you know. Right. Well, um, well, with that, thank you, Chris. And I want to take the opportunity to thank... Uh, all the speakers and the audience for participating. And uh, thank you to the Julia organizers as well. I declare the mini symposium to be over. Um, we'll be happy to receive questions on pigeonhole and answer them as um, in the future as well. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day.